there's nowhere on earth quite like Dubai, one of the most popular tourist destinations on earth, with landscapes and skylines that simply take your breath away. On the southeast coast of the Persian Gulf, it's one of Asia's most glittering jewels. Not that some of the greatest athletes on the planet will have time to enjoy the scenery. For them, it's strictly business. For the 19th Dubai Marathon, the start of which is just moments away. Well, hello and a very warm welcome to our live coverage of the Middle East's largest mass participation event. Some 30,000 expected to be involved today, but of course we're concentrating on the elites in a race that traditionally produces some lightning quick times. Let's check on the weather conditions then. It's around about 6 a.m. local time. Temperature is 19 degrees. By the time the men finish, about 8 o'clock, it's expected to be around about 23. Hardly a breath of wind, as you can see. So pretty much perfect conditions, albeit that they're going to be running in the darkness for around about an hour. So that just adds another twist to what should be a fascinating race. Let's check out the course then. And if you were with us last year, well, it's changed significantly. The runners will head up Al Sufa from the start and uh, they'll pass the Dubai College Junction. Carry on past the entrance to uh, Palm Island on the other side. The next uh, landmark is Dubai Media City. Then they'll U-turn by the Western Hotel, head back the way they came on Jumeirah Beach Road, passing by the seven-star Burj Al Arab, the second uh, mortgage required, of course, to book a room there, uh, and its nearby neighbour, the Jumeirah Beach Hotel. They stay on the left carriageway all the time, running towards the new bridge at the creek, but they make a U-turn just before the bridge, and then they head back to the Madinet Jumeirah Junction and do exactly the same section again. Now, it's a really flat course, and as I mentioned, because of the early start time, racing conditions ideal. We are expecting some very, very quick times today. So that's the final turn of the, the main loop of the course. Uh, the final charge to the line, we'll see the leaders turn left after the Burj Al Arab and run along Um Sequin Road for 500 metres or so. And then they head to the finish line, which is just by the Dubai Police Academy. Now, in addition, of course, to the elite races, we've got arguably the strongest ever field in the wheelchair event, which is about to start. Rafa Botello, the defending champion, is in the field. He won by just three seconds last year uh, from Patrick Monaghan of Ireland, who is also in that list. Then you've got Marcel Hoog, a nine-time world champion, a double Olympic gold medalist. It's his first time here. They call him the Silver Bullet. Ernst van Dijk from South Africa, a ten-time Boston Marathon winner John Boy Smith who won this race here in Dubai in 2016 and a very highly rated Japanese Hiroyuki Yamamoto so it should be a, a fascinating wheelchair event the world record by the way uh, is 1 hour 20 and 14 seconds set more than 20 years ago there is a chance that that could potentially go today and if you are looking up your marathon times and you're going to come and say oh no boston they've run faster or they've gone faster uh, that doesn't count for world record purposes it's a point to point race silver bullet of marcel hoog who hasn't been here before and will want to make uh, some kind of a statement of intent you would imagine these uh, wheelchair athletes going off five minutes before the uh, elite athletes go at six and then the fun runner so to speak some of which take it pretty seriously will go off half an hour later there's also a 10k run and a 4k fun run we look back to when this event first started uh, back in uh, 2000 only a few thousand were here. Now, 30 odd thousand. Away they go then for the wheelchair race. And as I say, we're expecting a, a possible world record here. About an hour and a half. We'll try and pick these up for you at various stages uh, during the morning. But we're expecting him to finish somewhere around about 
20 past seven local time. So in about an hour and 20 minutes. And already you can see <laughs> the, the darkness here. They're starting half an hour earlier than usually. We usually start 6.30, but it is six o'clock here. And already you can see the leading protagonists have dropped some of the others. But as I say, we'll try and keep you in touch with exactly what's going on in that race as we go through the morning. Well, let's concentrate then on the uh, elite uh, races, which start shortly. My name's Trevor Harris. I'm joined by athletics author and journalist Pat Butcher and the women's marathon world record holder Paula Ratcliffe. Uh, morning both. Uh, just looking at the men's race, um, Pat, first of all, uh, it's a pretty strong field. Toler, of course, who we saw last year win. He was a surprise winner, I think it's fair to say. Chance he could repeat today? Oh, decidedly. I think um, the, uh, the the men's race seems to be the uh, the accent seems to be on him. Whereas when um, you know, we hand over to Paula for the women's race, I think there's uh, there's at least uh, three women with an even chance of winning there. So I suspect that might be uh, a more competitive race. But Tola ran here in 2014 as a youngster and did uh, 2617, but came back uh, last year having won an Olympic gold, a uh, uh, bronze medal rather, in the 10,000 meters in the inter him and um, just took a dozen seconds off the uh, off the the course record which might be a bit redundant because they seem to tweak this course every year so I suppose the uh, the race record might be uh, a, a little more ideal but I mean if you figure that he ran faster than Haile Gebre Selassie is you know illustrious countryman multiple world record holder then uh, now at 26 and having narrowly failed to win the world championship uh, medal, uh, gold medal in London um, last summer, uh, because he was carrying an Achilles tendon injury and would probably have won it, I think, and uh, we can talk about that later when the when the race unfolds. But I would say that he uh, he, he probably is a strong favourite to repeat for the first time since Gebre Selassie, in fact. Yeah, it's worth mentioning that that course record that Tola set uh, last year it was the tenth fastest marathon ever run. And he actually took two minutes off his personal best. Well, there we see the women lining up for the start. And the women's race, Paula, is absolutely fascinating because we've got Mergia, who, of course, uh, is a three-time winner here. She's unbeaten, in fact. Uh, she's won it the three times she's competed. Uh, and De Gaefer, of course, who won it last year, and rather like Tola, wasn't expected to. No, she wasn't expected to at all, and she actually hasn't raced a marathon since then. She's concentrated on the half marathon, but you've also got the likes of Mara de Barba in there, Rosa de Gera, who's put back-to-back -back marathons together very, very well, and we recently raced in, in Shanghai only about 11 weeks ago. Then you've got the likes of Teferi coming in, who has a huge pedigree on the track, but hasn't raced above 10 miles, a little bit like Alamaru uh, on the men's side. Yeah, it's, it's fascinatingly poised, uh, both men's and women's races, and we are just a few moments away from the start. And as I mentioned, this year they decided to put the fun runners out half an hour later after the elites. It, it is a very early time to start running a marathon, Paul. I th we were speaking earlier off air, and you were saying you never started a race at 6 a.m. What, what kind of problems might that pose? I think for, for the Ethiopian and Kenyan athletes, maybe less of a problem because they are used to training very early in the morning. They'll go out often at 5.30, 6 a.m. for their training runs to, to get those done. But the biggest problem for the marathon runners, I think, is, the, is managing your, your eating and your fuel loading in advance because when the start's going off at 6 a.m., some of these maybe wanted to get up around 2, 2.30 to, to eat or may have decided just to eat big last night and then try and sleep through. And just moments before the start, what kind of thoughts are swirling around your head? Because you've got to presumably shut everything out and just concentrate on what you want to do. You have got to focus, but in the first couple of kilometers is when you really get those answers. Is your body with you today? Are your legs answering the questions that you're going to ask of them? And you don't really know that. You can tell a little bit in warm up, but a lot of these girls and a lot of these guys will feel bad in warm up and then feel great once they start racing. So they want to get it underway and feel good. And Pat, chances of a quick time today in, in both the men's and the women's event? I would have thought so. I mean, we talked about the course itself being tweaked, but the start times also have been tweaked. When Haile Gebre Selassie ran here, it was always a 7 o'clock start. And he said it was great for the first hour, but when the sun came up, it uh, really posed him problems. That may be eliminated this year. Well, we are underway, as you can see. And you can hear a little bit of singing and chanting in the back. And we've got the kind of Ethiopian choir fan club 
so to speak, in the stand. They're here every year. The early start time doesn't seem to uh, deter them at all. Uh, so that's what you can probably pick up. And you can see the flashing lights, almost like something out of a sci-fi film as they head towards us early on. And of course, it'll be, it's going to be dark for about an hour. We re and lights are going to going to start getting light around about 7 a.m. so 60 minutes time that's something they're going to have to manage as well I think it is the glare of the lights uh, because when you're looking into a bright light and then you need to look down to a darker road to check your footing check where people are in front of you and that might pose difficulties in itself you can also see it's quite foggy so the humidity is pretty high here at the moment um, I was talking to someone last night who was explaining to me that the dew point here is around about 13 degrees. So at that point, it's it's very, very difficult to, to sweat efficiently um, when you're racing. And it's already above that now today. So it is picking up for them and it is drying out a little bit, but it's still very high and actually quite difficult conditions for marathon running. Yeah, I don't remember it being quite as misty as this in, uh, in previous years. Well, I, I was here once, Trevor, when it was 10 degrees and foggy, really foggy. I mean, there is quite a heavy mist this morning, as, uh, as everyone can clearly see. And I don't know if that's going to make any difference. I mean, Paula, when you ran yesterday morning in training, you said that you know, y your throat was hurting. There, it, there seemed to be um, quite a bit of pollution. Yeah, I mean, every year that you come back to Dubai, you see how much uh, it's growing. Uh, and I guess it's inevitable within that it's a huge city. Uh, that there will be levels of pol pollution. Uh, I may be sensed it a little bit, not on the levels that I did it in Beijing, but certainly on higher levels than, than other big cities that I've run in. This time in the morning on a Friday as well, when there's a lot less traffic around, I think it will be a lot better out there for these guys. Just spot Tola there, tucked in just behind uh, the leading three. We've got uh, a silver in the World Championships in London last uh, August, and obviously he's also a a medalist, as Pat was saying, an Olympic medalist at 10,000 metres. And I guess the, the key thing, as well as, as focusing in the early stages, Paul, is just keeping out of trouble. We've, we've had incidents before where there's been problems at the start and very early on. You want to just make sure you, you veer away from any of that. You absolutely do. And maybe that preempted the decision to, to set off the elite this year an hour ahead of, of the mass race because there was that little tussle at, at the start last year and Bekele ended up going down and that was pretty much race over for him so in this way they get underway and they've only really got probably less than 50 athletes on that start line to, to worry about and it's quickly thinning out and spreading out and they're starting now to concentrate on just getting themselves settled into that rhythm not using too much energy early on you can see the three pacemakers basically doing their job perfectly with a wall in front there uh, and the other runners just settling down behind them can't really assess too much of who's in that pack around them because it's dark um, so they really are just concentrating on just making sure they're in their right position and they're starting to, to feel their way into the rhythm you can see that the um, the street lights are providing a decent amount of light there and they also have a bike in front of them this year there is no blue line or white line or any colored line designating the the shortest route on this Dubai course they actually follow a cyclist who's dressed in blue and he measures the course and knows that shortest line so they'll be looking out for him or the pacemakers will certainly be looking out for him so they've gone through the first kilometre in 256 you mentioned that early on in the race Paul you kind of get an idea of how your body's feeling at what point in a race do you actually think do you know what I'm gonna go fast today is is it at this kind of stage or halfway or is it a plan that you even think about a day before a month before how does it work um it's definitely something i think you think about within the race but inside that i think it's very unique to each athlete i like to to get to halfway and then really put the hammer down from halfway i always felt that for me it was easier to run negative splits in a marathon uh, and better to run fast that way so to get to halfway feeling good and then push on from there but you know you're feeling good in the first half but it's about keeping a lid on it and controlling it so the pacemakers out front and I'm sure they're appreciating the fact that they're out on their own so to speak it is the the loneliness of a long distance runners plural with the fun runners waiting in the wings so to speak for their turn a little bit later and they're not doing a bad job now the pace asked for was 61.30 at halfway which is 14.35 through 
5k and they've gone through 256 so they're what one second off well we'll let them off with that one at this stage i think they're they're doing a good job what you don't want to do is go too fast in the early stages better to be a second or two back and then to make that up later on yeah the tactical battles between the likes of tola uh, lemma and Gesse will no doubt be played out uh, a little bit later in the race we've also got uh, Garamu in the race, uh, another Ethiopian, who was a late entry, and he's actually uh, he ran a personal best of 2:06.12 in, in last year, and that was only his third ever marathon. That was in Berlin in September. So uh, he's 25. There's a little bit of promise there. Yeah, I think that's what Dubai is really known for: is guys coming out here and girls uh, and really making a huge breakthrough. Um, it's probably the got the biggest prize money. Um, purse on the circuit but no appearance money so if you come here you better be ready to, to race well and to, to show that you're in shape and I think that's why as well as the flat course and, and the good conditions it's produced fast times year after year um, because these guys know that it's an opportunity for them to, to really make that breakthrough uh, and to come here in good shape if you're not in shape they often don't bother turning up well, what's interesting is 2012, 13, and 14. The, the race was won by a debutant in the men's uh, on the men's side on, on each occasion, and um, my goodness me, that's a, a slightly faster second kilometre that uh, uh, Paul is just indicating on screen. So, uh, yeah, every every race director and race race promoter wants to think that they've got a world record course. This certainly is a world record course, and it's going to you know, depend very much on how these guys work together and how the weather conditions uh, pan out but at the moment it's uh, it's all looking good but just to go back to those uh, those debutante winners some of them go on to greater things and others seem to disappear i mean the course record prior to tola running 2411 last year was set in 2012 by ayeli abshiro 21 year old he did 20423 out of the blue he and two other very fast Ethiopians got selected for the London Olympics. None of them finished the race, and he has seemed to have disappeared. Whereas Toler, in contrast, you know, almost won. You know, but for that injury, I don't know if you uh, agree with me, Paul. At 35k, he looked as if he'd won the World Championships in London there uh, last summer. Yeah, he, he did look really strong. Although listening to him talking in the press conference the other day, he said that it was one of the hardest races that he, he's ever raced in London and that he really did struggle in those closing stages, maybe because of the injury and the lack of training in the build-up too. Just going back to the prize money that you mentioned, uh, Paul, it's uh, $200,000 to the winner today. Uh, same for the men and women. We're uh, egalitarian in this sport. And there's also a quarter of a million dollar bonus if the world record uh, goes um, the world record for the men, by the way, just want to make a note of it, 202.57, set by Dennis Kometa of Kenya. That was in Berlin four years ago. The course record uh, is 204.11. Uh, and for the women, I won't, I won't uh, even embarrass you by asking you what the time was, but it was 215.25, and the course record is 219.31. But as, as Pat says, it is a different course, so always a little tricky to compare like for like because it's not really but that was a quick second kilometre yeah I think I agree with Pat I think it's a, a little bit too quick um, although that was the the pace of the of the pacemakers and you can see there is a little bit of a gap opened up behind just now starting to to, to get bridged but it's already starting to to fragment a little bit the field behind them they know that it's fast these guys will be very in tune with their own bodies the paces that they've trained at um, and a lot of the ones who got slightly burned in the past maybe came here last year went too fast in the first half Tola was the only one who was able to hold it together anywhere near um, well in the closing stages of last year so a lot of those guys will have learned those lessons and you can just see their third kilometer has popped up 253 so it's still very very fast um, they have scaled it back a little bit but there's probably been some shouts come from behind as well ease it back interestingly these are three Kenyan guys pacing for majority of, of Ethiopian guys racing today I don't know whether that's significant or not but the world record is held by a Kenyan Indeed it is. And in fact, only Kenyans and Ethiopians have ever won the men's race. Seven Kenyans and 11 Ethiopians. And when we showed you the start list at the beginning of the show, uh, that list obviously dominated by runners from those two particular countries.
So those three at the front, all placemakers. There's Tola in the blue, looking very strong. He was only the eighth fastest man in the field, actually, last year when he won the way. We were talking about it being a surprise. He, he may have even surprised himself, but I was interested in what he said after. He said he thought he could have gone quicker. He could have gone inside 204, he said. Yeah, and I think probably he could have done because that was a little bit too fast in, in the early stages last year. Uh, and if he'd gone through, say, in, in 62 um, minutes at halfway last year, maybe he could have run faster, but it's easy to say that afterwards. It's what you do on the day and that really counts. And it's actually Ronald Correa of Kenya who is sitting in behind the three Kenyan pacemakers at the moment. And then Tola and Tura, they're just tracking him behind, but allowing a little bit of space to, to open up, which indicates that maybe they recognize that it's a little bit too quick in, in these early stages and they don't want to get carried away too early. Yeah, Korea's got a personal best, 207.26. Uh, that was in Frankfurt a couple of years back. He had um, an in and out 2017, you're probably fair to say, but he did finish third in Madrid last year. Well, I think it's worth mentioning in the last five years, only once has the men's winning time been outside 205. It's a very, very fast course just to underline how fast this, this is. And why is that, Pat? Is it a combination of the surface, the, how flat it is, the conditions? Well, uh, it's probably the best road surface I would think anywhere in the world. I don't know if, uh, if Paul or you've had a chance to uh, run on any any of this course, but I mean, even driving, you can see you know, it's almost almost as if the roads are, t are tailored like good lawns. You know, a bit like yeah, uh, you know, this is a Wimbledon, if you like, of uh, of marathon courses or certainly surfaces. Yeah, I think the only course you could probably compare it with in terms of the road surface is maybe Berlin, but um, it's it's definitely manicured out there. It's smooth. You'd be hard pushed to find any pothole or anything in this road, um, and it's it's not concrete, which is significant. We see the fourth kilometre. They've settled down back now into to that 256, which is better, and there's probably some relief in the pack behind that that's eased back to that pace they do see the clock on the car in front of them so every kilometer they will see the previous kilometer or the kilometer they've just passed um, flash up on, on the the car in front of them to give them an indication of how fast they're going there was some debate over whether they would get shouted out to them the the splits every kilometer last night um, I'm not sure whether that's happening or not but certainly they will see the, the cumulative time and the individual kilometre splits. That's Seifu Tura on the right-hand side of your screen in the orange, running alongside Tola, who's uh, one of the youngest uh, in the field, is uh, in his early 20s. Hasn't got too much marathon experience, um, but he was second in Seoul uh, just a couple of months ago, in fact. He ran inside uh, two hours ten. I mean, just to go back to that lead car, which is showing the uh, the runners the cumulative times. I think it's also got a facility for showing them what that means would the finishing time would be. So, I mean, they they should be getting a lot of uh, very good information out there. Well, we've seen every time we look at those pacemakers, we see them every kind of 10, 15 seconds just glancing down at the watch. So they're clearly taking their duties very seriously, as they should, to try and set up a, as fast a time as possible here. I mentioned the uh, sorry, sorry, Pat. I mentioned Paul of the uh, tour there, the youngster. What, what do you think is kind of the prime age? When are you, when are you at your peak? I know I'm asking you these difficult questions, and you're grinning at me. What, what's a pro peak age for your average marathon run? Well, again, I think it, it's very individual. It used to be that the marathon was an event that you would move to towards the end in your, of your career. So you would race first on the track and gradually progress up the distances, a little bit like I did. So I was 28 when I ran my first marathon, 29 uh, when I ran the, the 215 in, in London. Um, but now you see people coming straight to the marathon and almost skipping that uh, phase of racing over five and 10,000 meters and half marathon and, and people making debuts. I think we've got an 18 year old making um, a marathon debut here today. So it can really, really vary. I think the significant thing is more that I believe you have a certain number of top class marathons in your legs. So whether you start that at 20 or whether you start that at 30, that's gonna sort of signify how long your career is probably gonna go on. And if you race hard and you race often, then you're gonna have a shorter racing career than if you race less often and maybe don't push it right to the well every time. 
Well, that ladder on the screen, you can see that uh, all of the, uh, the, the the top hopes, top favourites are, are right in there behind the uh, pacemakers, if if a few metres behind. But at an accelerated uh, uh, pace like this, it's hardly uh, hardly surprising that they're uh, uh, they're staying a off off the back of those pacemakers. Just going back to what we were saying about age, Paul, because it, it, it works into this quite well. Uh, Mo Farah uh, has been so successful, 5,000, 10,000 metres, had a stellar career. He now is going into marathons. The fact that he's run 5 and 10 for so many years, does that possibly take something out of the legs? He was just talking about it, or do you think he can have a phenomenal career over this longer distance? Um, it's a good question because I, I think that in all fairness for, for Mo Farah he's shown that he's the best in the world over five and ten thousand meters double Olympic champion to how, many, how many times world champion he's put those races back to back and he's shown that that he is the best in the world right now over those distances he hasn't shown that yet over the marathon and he is also world-class over 1500 meters so to have that range from 1500 meters right up to the marathon is a very very big ask i mean we see galeta burka running out here she's run 358 over the 1500 meters on the women's side um and only so far 226 at the marathon so it is it is a big jump and the style of running the efficiency of running is very different so mo's aware of that and i think he's more relishing the challenge of the fact that it's a distance he can sort of get his teeth into something fresh uh, and see how he is at that and take the the not the staleness but i think he just felt that he'd done everything that he could do on the track and now he wanted to take on a new challenge well time will tell you can see on screen there they're 10 seconds uh, inside world record pace after the first 5k is that a bit is that a bit quick pat do you think well i mean as paul indicated earlier it uh, well certainly that second uh, kilometer was 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 a bit rapid i mean it really is too too early to tell you know when the current world record was set they did go out at a very frantic pace but then dropped off in the middle of the race to something which was quite sedate but then came with an almighty sort of last 5 10k you you really can can never tell I know you've been following the sport for many, many years, Pat. What, what's your view on Mo Farah and his, his marathon potential career? Well, I, I've already been on air at the uh, after the World Champ saying that I, I thought that maybe he he sort of lacked that concentration factor to be going all all the way to you know 42.195k, and um, and he's done so much and uh, you know. I mean, I know. I mean, Carlos Lopes of, uh, of Portugal won the Olympic marathon when he was 37 years old, so age is not necessarily a deterrent, except that Lopez was injured a lot during his career, and I think he just maintained that sort of uh, that excitement about uh, world-class running that when he got back into it, he, he capitalised on it, so that's why you know, he could win the Olympic marathon at 37. But Mo has done so much, I just, I just wonder if that's going to be a sort of slight deterrent to him, you know, main, maintaining excellence across the distances, as Paul says, from 1500 meters to 42.195. So the sixth kilometer, 257. So they're still inside uh, world record pace. I think I saw 645, Paula, for the first 5k for the women. We got a, a brief shot of them through the darkness. Um, just put 645 into some kind of context for us after 5k for the women. Uh, 1645. Uh, 16, uh, for, sorry, <laughs> um, for the women going through there. So they're they're on a reasonable pace. The pace that was asked for in the the women's race were there actually three pacemakers, and I think two of them may actually be related to some of the athletes running. But they asked for 70 minutes at halfway, and that's the lead group of women that you can see there, including Teferi. I saw Mara de Barba. It's very difficult in the dark to actually work out who, who those athletes are running there. I'm sure that's Mergia on the other side. So I think most of the main protagonists are there in that group. There is a following group with a pacemaker that have asked for 71.30, so that's 2.23 pace at halfway. So, I mean, it's it's sub 2.20 pace at the minute, or pretty much close to that with the, the 16.45. Um, so they're on schedule and they're settling in, and you can see the two pacemakers in front doing a good job there, and the women pretty much just settling down behind them and nothing really exciting yet happening in this women's race as you wouldn't expect in the first five kilometers it will start to, to build up much later in the race here well we've had uh, ethiopian uh, winners in the women's race for the last six years um, russian women actually won the first four editions the angle won twice even over 
uh, and Pemiratria also won, but uh, it's been Ethiopian, Ethiopian dominated of late. Back with the men then, there's Korea the youngster. And Tola just in behind him. Well, just to pick up on that uh, point, Trevor, I mean, in the in the men's, I think it's nine out of the last ten years has been won by an Ethiopian. And uh, there is actually an error in the uh, in the program. The Ethiopian women have won the last ten races. Uh, I think uh, uh, Aselefetch Mergia, one of her three victories, she's uh, she somehow turned into a Kenyan. I mean, and this race did um, did did used to be pretty much um, you know even-handed between Kenyans and Ethiopians, but in recent years it seems to have devolved very much into a, an Ethiopian race. I don't know if the Kenyans just don't like running so early in in the year um you know maybe a, a bit too too many uh, christmas festivities uh, or what but it's it, it's certainly been ethiopia all the way the past decade so the car do you have to uh, in the middle of your screen another ethiopian who's uh, 23 just coming up 24 and he broke 60 minutes for the half marathon in valencia last october 59 22 that's the eighth fastest time in the world he was third in that race uh, eighth fastest time last year, of course, that means. But there are several runners in, in both the men's and women's race who are kind of coming from half marathons and blooding themselves in the full distance in Dubai. Well, speaking of which, Ayanu um, uh, of, uh, of Ethiopia has got some you know, terrific track times, really, really rapid, under 7.30 for 3K, or 3,000 metres on the track, and actually you know, uh, 12.48, which is quite an extraordinary time for 5,000 metres. And uh, he's run uh, good, um, good t 10K and right up to 10 miles as well. So, I mean, if he can keep it together. You know, that tradition of debutante winners here might, uh, might extend to him. In fact, Paul, I was interested when uh, when you ran yeah, your race. You obviously had uh, some male pacemakers. I mean, do you, do you talk to him? Do you tell him to sort of yeah, slow down a bit, speed up a bit, and uh, or, or what? I mean, how, how does it work? I think it's probably um, again. I keep saying this, but it, it is individual. And I think I I met the the guys beforehand, um, and I had had some reservations before if I wanted to run it. I felt like I could run as fast as I was capable of doing on my own uh, with just the, the lead vehicles around me. Um, but I took it into my mind that I focused on the fact that I was going to actually concentrate on racing them. So I remember clearly when I beat one of them because they dropped out around the Isle of Dogs. And then um, I remember at the end being very frustrated that the other guy, Christopher Candy, had actually out sprinted me because we'd gone up different finish lines. And so he'd managed to get a, a second quicker than me at the end, which I was quite annoyed about because um, if I'd have been racing next to him, I definitely tried to, to race them and was conscious of the fact that people were going to say, oh, you've sat in behind the pacemakers the whole way. And so I ran alongside them and tried to, to run alongside, but I didn't really talk to them, no. I don't usually have that much energy for, for talking to anybody during the race. Well, I mean, Trevor was asking earlier about prognostications. I mean, did you have a time in mind when you went into that race? I never ran with times um, in mind. I more ran with times that I was trying to get ahead of. So. Um, I was of the view that if you were trying to hit specific split times, what would you do if you were ahead of those? Would you panic uh, and think you've got to slow down? Or would you just keep pushing on? So I more tried to tune into my body. And my goal going into that 2003 race was to hit as many miles as I could under the average time of what I'd run in Chicago. So I knew I was capable of going quicker and just to try to run a little bit quicker each mile and then build up from there. Well, we're about a fifth of the way through um, the men's race, and they are still well inside world record places you can see there 13 seconds inside to be precise uh, eight kilometers in 23 29 they have covered that distance in it's very very quick although we, we have seen this in previous years in fact certainly two years ago paula when we were here i seem to remember a similar similar kind of figure at this stage and it didn't transpire into anything close to a world record yeah, I mean, it, it's a difficult area. You can see there, Tola looking very, very strong. He's moving forward um, in this pack for pretty much the first time. He's controlled it, but he's not really made any significant move, and I don't think this is a significant move yet. Um, without a doubt, in that group, 
there are guys who will not be there probably even in five kilometers but certainly in another 15 kilometers they will not be able to handle this pace um, but they are going with it now uh, it, it's a very difficult decision to make that's in Alamaru that we were talking about earlier in the white vest now coming onto the shoulder of Tola uh, and I think he's going to be a really interesting factor in this race when you jump in and you haven't raced above 10 miles there are a lot of questions in your mind but he was down on the start list to race last year didn't come because he wasn't ready so clearly he knows what it takes and what he needs to, what the shape he needs to be in and he knows the training that he's done so either he's committing over committing early in this race or he is in shape to come here and race very very well and give Tola a run for his money yeah and plus also when you are so inexperienced at this distance you know it's not unreasonable to expect you may make some mistakes early on yet you have to you wouldn't be human otherwise exactly and I think it's it's a nice position to be in you can come to the marathon and you can say okay I can take some risks here because if I screw up um, it's my first time and I'm just learning and let's face it the way we all learn is to make mistakes out there so it's a little bit of pressure off when you're a debutant coming into the race and you can maybe do some things that you wouldn't do if you were more a more seasoned experienced marathon runner well, it's worth mentioning that he's the same age as, uh, as Tola, 26 years old, but he's, he's been as conservative almost as you were with your marathon debut at 28, uh, because Tola was running marathons when he was 22, he certainly came here when he was 22, and did 2.617. We've just gone through kilometre number nine in 2.56, so uh, it ain't slowing much. 26.26, the uh, cumulative time for the first nine kilometres, 14 seconds, as you can see, inside world record pace. I'm trying to remember from, from memory a couple of years back when they started kind of seriously regressing. I think it was just past halfway, somewhere like that anyway, we'll see. Yeah, if you think back maybe to, to Monza and to the breaking two, um, Beard that, that happened in what was it April May time um, there the guys were able to hang together till halfway and it was then that people started to, to drop off so really those questions start getting answered around halfway before then a lot of these guys are capable of hanging with the pace that they'll need to do they run it they can run 61 minute pace for, for half marathon most of the guys in this group but it's whether they can handle that and carry it in their legs in the second half and there we'll see the questions start getting answered well, you'd be a good judge of this, Paula. I mean, uh, Tola's best half marathon is 59.37, so that's uh, you know close to two minutes outside the half marathon time that they're looking for here. Is is that just about right? Do you think? Um, yeah, I would guess. Um, uh, it's a, it's probably about right. I'm trying to think more from the women's side of it. So I think when I when I ran my personal best, I went through in just outside 68 minutes. Uh, and probably on the half marathon, I was capable of not much quicker than I'd run. So I'd run 65.40 um, for the half hour. Actually, I ran that afterwards. Um, but I knew I was in that kind of shape. So yeah, that kind of two, two and a half minutes maybe for the women, for me seemed about right. Having said that, in London last year, we saw Mary Katani go out uh, in 66 uh, high which was very very quick and she was able to to hold it together uh, in a way that I think surprised surprised me and surprised a, a lot of people the way she could hold it together in the closing stages we saw the damage that that did to the the likes of Tiranesh de Barba and Vivian Chariot behind her So 10 kilometers in then to this men's race. They've been running in the darkness for the best part of half an hour. You might be quite appreciative when the sun peeks through in about 30 minutes time. So the three pacemakers are the first three names on your screen. Tola right in the mix. Career also the youngster Lemma, who we haven't uh, really mentioned so far Sisei Lemma from Ethiopia who's here for the fourth year in a row was fifth on debut actually a few years back then fourth in a personal best he's run just over five uh, sorry two hours five minutes and he was third last year so that is progression fifth fourth third so he would expect to potentially get on the podium today or at least have a very good chance of it grew up at altitude Lemma on his parents farm 
Well, I think most of the guys here grew up at altitude um, and that's probably significant. Uh, people often ask why do the best distance runners come from hail from Kenya and Ethiopia and I think it's a number of things but one significant factor is certainly that they're born at altitude, grow up and train at altitude, eating um, a diet and living a lifestyle that's very conducive to running well over the long distances and also the fact that the culture, the number one sport in Ethiopia is probably marathon running or is certainly distance running um, and, and in Kenya too and that's not the case if you go to many other countries around the world. That 10k time, 29.07, is 16 seconds now up on the pace that Dennis Kometo ran when he ran that world record in Berlin. So it's very, very fast. Is it too fast? I think it probably is at this stage, although you can see the gap back from the pacemakers to the main pack is starting to grow. So the main pack are starting to realize that, hey, this is a little bit too quick, guys. Can we sit back off this a little bit, please? And they're hoping that by them letting that gap open up, the pacemakers will realize and will just scale it back a little bit. Well, presumably they do look behind them from time to time and see what's going on. There we go. Well, this is a bit bold, isn't it? Yeah, this is maybe maybe a little bit naive or maybe he's just testing people out a little bit saying, OK, guys, you think this is fast? Well, this is for me. This isn't fast um, and it isn't for him yet at this stage, but it's very, very early to be doing that. What he's trying to do is just bridge that gap back so that he's sitting back in that almost V formation that was probably made made a little bit famous by Elliot Kipchoge in that breaking two bid and how they ran that V formation but with a lot more pacemakers and with a pacemaker formation that they knew was going to be consistent and going to be there all the way through the race. That isn't going to be the case today. I'm not sure how far the pacemakers are going to try and go but I would imagine they'll be trying to go to around about 30 kilometers which is quite a way into this race but not right to the end so at some point these guys at the front will have to be making the pace themselves uh, and working hard for their time today another of those up there is uh, Bahami Legese who's again a half marathon specialist he's had a lot of success he's won half marathons in Berlin in New Delhi in Ras Al Khaimah which is in the uh, United Arab Emirates in fact he's won twice in New Delhi um, and three of those winning times uh, below an hour well, just to underline the two guys right behind the pacemakers we're talking about are both marathon debutants and um, you know they're uh, may, maybe being a bit presumptuous to uh, to be running so fast so early but uh, yeah it's paid off in the past it's the impetuosity of youth pat i think is part of it a little bit of adrenaline and the experience of the likes of total in behind it's not going to be phased by that i don't think it's going to be particularly concerned that two young marathon debutants are, are trying to put the hammer down after 10 kilometers no i think he's probably concentrating on just sitting back a, a little bit just letting the race unfold around him he doesn't need to worry about trying to to chivy the pacemakers along at, at any point if he wanted to come here and run fast he's getting that uh, and he can now just sort of allow the story to to tell itself and allow the people coming in to, to make their mistakes around him or to, to commit themselves and show the shape that they're in. And he needs to just take it in as the other guys do in that group and get some idea. We've lost picture there, so hopefully we will get those back as soon as possible. So you can okay. see that the, the second five kilometers, as opposed to the first five, was a bit quicker. Nine seconds quicker. You can see, um, you can see Mario de Barber there with a the water bottle, just dropped the water bottle, sitting right behind the pacemakers. Um, behind her, I think it is still to ferry, although it's very hard to, to read on the screen, I'm afraid, at the moment. Um, but it looks like Mergia on the far side too so i don't think the, the girls in that pack have changed um, since we saw them at five kilometers i think the main group are still there and the people that we would expect to, to be there the pace has just picked up slightly i mean it was maybe a little bit um cautious the first five kilometers for them um but that's better way to run it and i would say it might pan out to be a wiser way than we're seeing in the men's race yeah i think i spotted uh for the winner last year also on the left-hand side 
pretty sure. It's hard to pick them out, uh, obviously, because it's pitch black still in Dubai. And our cameramen and motorbikes working overtime to try and uh, illuminate the pictures for you. So we go back to the men. Tola looking really relaxed. We have two in behind him. 21 seconds inside world record pace, 12 kilometers in. They, they are not slowing down. I think, and correct me if I'm um, wrong here, Trevor, but I think that world record uh, is actually the even projection or the even pace that would be required to, to hit the world record rather than the actual splits that um, Dennis Cometo ran when he did that. I'm not sure whether that's significant or not at this stage, but they're probably not going to run it in, in an even split way today. Um, certainly the way they've committed early on. I'm just looking now to see if I can see where Alan Maru has gone. He is further back. He, he is still in there. He's just dropped further back down that pack, and it's now Tola who's reasserted his dominance at the, at the front of the, the main pack of racers in this field here today, but already starting to thin out a lot. Yeah, so it's a little brief sojourn towards the uh, front for those two. They've now dropped back into the, the main little bunch, just behind the likes of Tola and have to. And Korea on the, uh, on the well, kind of in the middle now in the orange vest. Just going back to the times, it does have a, a serious reputation, as we've mentioned before, for being a quick course. Um, 2012, four men ran sub two hours, five minutes. And the winning time, which was uh, Abshero's 204.23, was the fourth quickest ever at the time. And that was on his marathon debut. same year it was the first time that the top three in a women's marathon had all run sub 220. I'm just looking in that pack and alongside Alamaru there is a runner who has number 2413 on their vest um, and I'm afraid I don't have any idea who that is but he's right up there in the leading pack I don't know if he was a late entry or picked up the wrong number and didn't have his name on his bib but the others do all seem to have their names on their bibs that he has a number there instead i think all of us are scratching our heads at that one we'll try and find out for you who that might be well you you will get this occasionally where you know, a top class runner will be a bit miffed and not getting an entry in the race so they'll just put in a, a citizen's entry if you like they'll they'll turn up and uh, you know and try and prove their point Two fifty one. <laughs> I'm not sure whether the pacemakers have got the message from those behind. This is mad, isn't it? At this stage, it, it's it's very um, foolhardy. You can just see Kip Yeager there checking his watch as if to think, oh, have I looked at that wrong? Maybe he's Mr. Mr. Digit of um, the times that it, he's aiming for. Um, but certainly there is a, a gap behind a cushion, if you like, where these guys are maybe trying to say, you're going too fast, back off a little bit. It is a, it is a difficult job to pace, mate, because you've got to be aware of, of what's going on behind you. It's not about you and your body and how you feel racing. It's about judging how the guys behind are doing and what they want from you and doing the best job possible. And it, it's a it's a big technique to, to master. And I think that's why we see the same guys often time and time again come back and do pacemaking jobs. Or we see guys who ahead of their marathon debuts as it were come and just try their hand at pacemaking first just to get a feel for the pace that people want to run at or are prepared to run at in the first half of the race. Well, I think it's worth saying that Kip Yeager is a terrific half marathon himself. He's run 59 minutes and 14 seconds, and anything under the hour is, you know, is really, really world class. <clears throat> but what will happen is that he may not be on optimum form, so his, his agent or his manager will say, here, you know, 
do a bit of pacemaking for us, you know, you'll get a bonus, uh, etc. especially if a fast time, a course record, or even a world record uh, is run. But in contrast, one of the other pacemakers in there, Kibitok, his best time is 61.50 for a half marathon, and they're running 61.30, or they're heading for 61.30, so he's close to his, uh, his best, uh, whereas Kip Yego is a couple of minutes outside his best. Maybe that's what happened, he's going for a PB. <laughs> yeah, he, he didn't quite read the brief correctly, maybe. Just uh, worth mentioning, we've got a lot of the fun runners uh, just jogging towards the start. We'll, uh, there you go. They've been, uh, no doubt, training and preparing for this for, well, hopefully for a quite a while. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know what they say, fail to prepare, prepare to fail, but uh, they're raising an awful lot of money for charity. A lot of them, there's some corporate... Uh, competitions within that race as well so we wish all of those well well it might be a, an amusing anecdote for us it certainly wasn't for Ken and Issa Bekele last year but one of the reasons that these two starts have been separated by uh, an hour this year is that when uh, Ken and Issa fell you know in the melee at the start of the elite race the uh, yeah the public race if you like was off pretty much immediately afterwards and he said that one of the uh, one of the, the public runners recognized him dragged him to his feet said oh my god but kelly go on go on go on <laughs> so, yeah but uh, as paula said he that was his race over effectively because they uh, they ran the similar sort of pace to what they're doing now for the first 5k last year and he was nowhere near 26 seconds it's just come down a little bit maybe a, a little dose of reality yeah significantly there that 14th kilometer outside of three minutes so 301 a 10 second difference from the the 13th kilometer so yeah i think the memo has been got somebody maybe has shouted from the pack behind kip Yego is starting to to break a little bit cabruto with him so uh, they are realizing that it's it's faster than these guys want and and starting to, to tack it back a little bit to a more reasonable pace interesting what pat was saying paul i, I guess you've never been manhandled by um some guy dressed as a rhino or uh, a big bird on the start line of a marathon have you no, 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 that hasn't ever happened. Although I have to say when I, when I got the opportunity to, to run in London in 2015 and, and went off the, um, the mass club, the, the club start essentially then, it, it was one of the, the best experiences that, that I've had running the marathon because you are in amongst all of the atmosphere. And that's what the guys in the elite race in some sense miss out on because they don't have that, that camaraderie around them that you experience further back, but at the same time, time they have the full elite treatment they have their own special drinks laid out all along the course they have the road to themselves they can pretty much pick the line that they want to to run along uh, and that's a lot more difficult to do when you're in a mass start with a lot of people around you sometimes can help some of the mass runners who don't want to go off too fast the fact that they are held back by the sheer volume of runners around them well it's interesting you look at the stats when this event started in 2000 total amount of runners and this is the marathon the 10k and the 4k uh, fun run less than two fewer than 2000 uh, last year that number had risen to 25,000 plus and this year they're hopeful uh, it might even be up to 30,000 so it has captured the public's imagination in this part of the world I mean, there's clearly a lot of expats that still uh, run here, but I think the uh, the Dubai Sports Council is really making big efforts to to get the uh, the local population uh, interesting, and not not only you know from from a, a health perspective, but from a, you know social perspective as well. There are apparently, 400 events now in Dubai of one sort or another over the year. And the marathon's just one of four, I think they said at the press conference, that has got a five-star ranking. And, well, that's not surprising. The marathon has given the fast times they've produced over the past, uh, well, ten or so years. So back to the women, 45 minutes in nearly. Still trying to pick them out. There's DeBarba, clearly. Yeah, there's De Gaefer sitting behind her. Um, Tesfaya behind her. Uh, on the far side, I can see Tedessa. I think is that measure on the far side of, of Divaba? I think it, it may be, but it's starting to get. You can see the the sun starting to peak a little bit above the the skyline here, and we're starting to get a little more 
light on this women's race. They don't benefit from the, the floodlights, if you like, that the, the men have got around them to, to help us pick out the numbers. But for them, I think it, it's pretty comfortable conditions right now, although it did start off quite humid uh, and difficult, very dark around the women when they were running earlier on. Well, they've got about another 15 minutes before it's significantly lighter. So uh, you'll get a much clearer view um, from seven o'clock onwards local time. Well, as you can see, the women have got a couple of men pacemakers uh, in there too. Uh, I think we, we probably haven't mentioned it, but um, I mean, De Barber, it was the uh, world champion in 2015 and then got a bronze medal in the Olympic Games in, uh, in, in Rio. And uh, so she's, she's probably, I suppose, with a, uh, uh, with a history like that, a, a marginal favorite um, here, do you think, uh, Paula, despite the fact that Mergi has won uh, three times and has sort of got a lock on this race, if you like? Yeah, I mean, I'm getting a bit better a look now, and I, I don't think that is, that isn't Mergi on, on the far she's, side. She's uh, up there, I'm sure, somewhere. I'm sure I've seen her. She was earlier on, but I can't see her in that pack anymore. Um, I don't know. I mean, she ran a very, very wise race in, in London last year, um, Mergia, when the others went out very, very fast. She stuck to her pace, ran very conservatively in the early stages and picked up a lot of the debris in the closing stages of that race to, to get herself up to third. But prior to that, it really had been uh, Mara de Barba who'd kind of got it right more often in, in the big races, particularly in the championship races. And she's right up there now today, looking very, very good. De Gaefer debuted here last year, surprised a lot of people, and has come here this year with that weight of expectation on her. People are expecting her to reproduce what she did last year. So far, she's shown that she's capable of doing that. She's certainly tracking Mara de Barba. She's not interested in going in front of her. You can see the eye line focusing on the heels of Mara de Barba in front of her, and she's not going to commit too much in this race at this point. Are you surprised, Paula, that De Gaefer didn't do more marathons in 2017 rather than half marathons after after what we saw from her here in January? Yeah, a little bit, um, but she is young. She's still got a lot of a uh, career ahead of her. Maybe she decided just to, to scale back. She had made a lot of money in her first marathon race here, so she didn't need financially to, to race another marathon for the rest of that year. Maybe it was a long-term plan to her to come back this year and in between her to work on her speed um, and just race a few of those half marathons and gain racing experience before she really goes on to the championship stage at the marathon. Well, after that um, slower 14th kilometer, uh, we've gone back to, well, normal um, service has been resumed. 2.56 for kilometer 15, 2.54 for the 16th kilometer, which means 47.03 total, 20 seconds inside. Uh, world record pace, so they, they've picked it up again, and it's now, as you can see, significantly lighter. Just briefly to go back to uh, De Gaefer, I understand that she did want to run a uh, an autumn marathon, but she picked up an injury which, uh, you know, obviated uh, that. So that's the, pretty much the reason why she's uh, she's had a whole year of just running half marathons and is uh, is, is back here. De Barber and De Gaefer, just a cigarette paper between them at the moment, those two big names. Looks like Tedesse on the far side, who was an unknown when she first came here, it was back in 2011, and then she smashed her personal best by more than six minutes in that race. And since then, she's won in Seoul, Shanghai, and in Paris, although she has had um, quite a few injuries over the last few years so good to see her back fit again well we were talking about ages to debut uh, earlier on I mean in many ways the uh, the, the Africans have, uh, have sort of upset so many uh, you know, prejudices that we've had in the past. I mean, Paula sounded aghast at the idea of running a marathon at 18 years of age, and uh, I said so, so. So would most people outside of uh, of Africa be? Uh, but I mean, a lot of the women here are are fairly mature nowadays. They're in their you know, they're, well, in this race in particular, they're in their late uh, late 20s as. Uh, 
as the uh, the dawn really is breaking now, and uh, so is the pace of the women's race by the looks like. Yeah, I think Zubaba and Degefa there deciding with Tedessa following them. Oh, she missed a drinks bottle, Myra Dubaba, so she's just gone back for that. <laughs> it is a technique in itself, to which some of these women maybe need to practice to make sure that you are aware of when those drink stations are coming up and that you can move ahead to get that. So what we may have been seeing there was Zubaba trying to get ahead. She was on the wrong side of the road. The, the drink station tables are all on the left-hand side. So if you're running on the right-hand side of the pack, and you're coming up to 5, 10, 15, 20 kilometers, 25 kilometers, you need to start to get on the other side of the road to be able to, to sight your bottle um, and to be able to get it without any mishaps. And she didn't quite manage to do that. So that was probably the reason for them accelerating there was to try and get on the right side of the road to be able to, to get their bottles or the left side. So back with the men, uh, kilometer 17, 255. So. This is uh, starting to get interesting now as we head vaguely towards halfway. 21 k's will be the halfway point there or thereabouts. And you can just see every time we come back to, to this lead pack of, of men, there's one more guy just tailing off back down the road behind her, and that is the carnage that's inevitable really when they go out at the pace that they have done today. Uh, as we said a while back, there are only going to be a certain number who are going to be able to, to absorb that pace and to, to carry on running decent in the in the second half of the race. Toll is certainly one of those, and there will be some more in that group behind him, but every time you can see the gaps growing and growing back down the road, and some of these guys are not even going to be able to finish today because of the pace that they've committed to early on in this race. Well, fair play to Tola. He's making no bones about this, is he? He's, uh, you know, he's putting his stamp on the race, pretty much as he tried to do in the World Championships last summer when he was carrying that injury. But uh, he said when he came, uh, started back in October after a two-month rest to uh, get over the Achilles tendon injury, he's just been feeling better and better and better. So uh, that's why he's so confident, I think. Yeah, he's got that smooth style as we uh, head back towards the start line for the the uh, mass participation event. Fantastic to see so many people in this part of the world just raring to go for a marathon. Some of them, of course, will not have run a marathon before. A personal achievement just to complete, not bother too much about the time. Well, it's interesting you should uh, mention that, uh, Trevor, because I was uh, wanting to ask Paula, you know, when, when the marathon boom sort of first began in earnest about 30-odd years ago, I remember newspapers running eight-week training programs, which I just thought was insane. I mean, when people ask you about what should I do, what, what do you say? I mean, I'd say, well, don't you know, train for at least a year. Oh, I don't know about a year. I think a lot of people might get hurt if they train for a year. Certainly lose motivation if they train for that long ahead of a, a major target. Um, I think I think if you've never run before, then you're looking at a 16 to 20 week build up to, to be able to comfortably run a marathon and enjoy it. Um, but for these guys, they can turn it around in six, seven, eight weeks, certainly. Um, so when you already have a base level of fitness, then you, you can come into a marathon and build up to it a, a lot quicker than if you're starting from scratch, which is, is probably normal. Um, and I think if you're just trying to, to get around a marathon and you're trying to run in the four hour uh, range, then you don't need, obviously, as intensive a build up as if you're trying to, to challenge the two hour barrier. I mean, what, what lead in period did, did you have from the time when you thought, you know, I've got to start thinking about marathons now until you, you actually set out on one? Uh, it couldn't be longer, I think, than, than four months, so longer than, than 16 weeks or so, because I think then the danger was that you'd get in shape too soon, and it's very, very hard to hold it when you get into that kind of treading the line shape between tipping it over and getting ill or injured uh, and being able to get to the race and, and give it your absolute best shot. So I would generally not start any hard work in build-up until January for an April marathon. Fascinating. Okay, so 55 minutes in nearly, and uh, obviously you can get a much better view now of what's going on out in the course. Absolutely pancake flat. It's, it's the odd little 
uh, rise for a short part of the course to where the uh, the bridge has been built, although they're not actually going over the bridge, but it is a slight incline. De Barber there, centre of your screen, looking confident. And right behind her, tracking her every move. Work to gave for one last year. About 12 or 15 women in that little group. Yeah, it's a big group and we can't see yet who is in the back portion of that group. I can see Dida there, there is Teferi. I haven't seen Mergia in there, so uh, we're not sure if she is still in that leading pack of women or if she's running with the second pack. Uh, she may yet be on, be on the back of that, we just haven't had a shot of it. January is actually the, the coolest month of the year here in Dubai. You heard Pat mentioned earlier, we had some pretty chilly days here. It's not warm, even though it's uh, 7 o'clock, and in previous years it's been distinctly uh, sunny, but not, not this year. Well, I was surprised at that 19 degrees. It certainly doesn't feel that warm to uh, to me. I'd, I'd think more 15 or 16. I've worked out, Pat, but I don't know if you agree. As you get older, it feels colder. <laughs> so that 15 seconds inside world record pace, that's coming down now as the kilometre times go up, per kilometre times go up. They are still very much on the asked for pace though, if not a little bit ahead of that. And, and that's probably more significant at this stage. Um, like I say, it, I, I think these guys are gonna find it very hard today to, to run negative splits in this race um, because they have gone out so hard. So what they're looking at is to try and hit that halfway mark somewhere around the, the 61.30 uh, and then be able to, to hang on a, a, as well as possible in the second half. Uh, to come back and to run faster is pretty much impossible now given the pace that they've gone out at. So what they need to do is just maintain that fall off uh, as well as they possibly can and not allow that to be too significant in, in, the, in the second half of this race. Well, as Trevor mentioned earlier, there's a new bridge along the uh, the beach road, and uh, the the course has been truncated. Well, not truncated overall. They've 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 switched it, so there's an extra couple of turns in there. But you just saw one of them. They're so broad that it doesn't really you know, stop the athletes uh, you know, running at that that same pace at all. And in fact, in the past. This long, long, long beach road. Some of the athletes have said, "Well, you know, it's a bit boring, you know." So, so, so maybe that extra couple of turns are going to uh, help these uh, these guys concentrate. Yeah, I mean, it, it can be difficult. It's one of the the factors, I guess, that people talk about also in Berlin and in Dubai is the long straight roads, which enable you to to really keep your speed and keep your momentum. But as you said, Pat, it, it's also then difficult to keep your focus, particularly if you're on your own and, and you're running along there. It's much easier if there's a little bit more of interest and more to, to look at in the course. And I think significant in the fact that they've missed out that bridge is that they're missing out the, the incline and then the decline off it. So they're trying to maintain it uh, as flat and fast as possible. And also, had it been windy, it's not actually windy today. It has been in previous days, but it's not at all today then that would have been a factor in terms of breaking up the time running into that headwind. So just a few seconds until the mass start. They, they know they're going to get that little bit of TV time by being in front of that group. I mention it being boring. I mean, there are some phenomenal sights to look at on this route. When you jog past the uh, Burj, Burj Al Arab and wonder how on earth you could ever afford to stay there. But these guys and women, just seconds away from their 2018 fitness quest and I mentioned a lot of them are being sponsored raising vast amounts for all kinds of charities 
And that's another of the huge positives about amateur marathon running. Moving the photographers out the way because they don't want to get stampeded by this lot. And there they go. It could take anywhere from, what, no, three hours to maybe seven or eight for some of them. 26 miles, 42 kilometres lie ahead. I think that might have been a little bit of a false start there, but um, we'll let them away with that. Who's instead. counting? Well, good luck to each and every Whoa! one of them. And we're going to be concentrating our coverage on the uh, elite events, which, uh, as far as the men are concerned, are about they're about halfway, just under halfway in, an hour and a minute on the clock. So we're back with the leading women now. I'm just checking on their times just under the hour for the first 18 kilometers yeah and that's that's fast running from the lead women if you think about it the, the 20s are pretty significant so 520 mile in 320 kilometers gives you a 220 marathon um, so they're running sub 220 pace significantly for for most of this race um, uh, and it's the fast times that we're seeing produced in the men's race have definitely been replicated on the women's side. Maybe took a little bit more of a cautious start to it, but now they've really got into the running. Uh, and there's a big pack there together at 2.20 pace, which is significant. Yeah, just a reminder of the women's course record, 2.19.31. That was set by uh, Mergia, who we're still not exactly sure where she is. She didn't appear to be in that leading group. And in fact, Although she's won the race three times, a couple of those wins were absolute thrillers. One by three seconds and one by a single second. So let's hope for some kind of a, as close to finish as that in about an hour and a quarter's time. Well, she did say that um, she was particularly pleased by the one second victory, not only for the, um, you know, uh, winning a sprint finish, if you like, but uh, she'd come back from childbirth, the birth of her, uh, of her first daughter, of her daughter. Yeah, I don't think she'd actually run a marathon distance race for nearly three years before that either, so it was even more uh, spectacular as a victory. Pacemakers continuing to take him along, but the uh, pace has dropped, as you can see, down to eight seconds now in terms of a comparison with the world record. 2.55 the last kilometre. So that is 61.20 for them through 21 kilometers, so not quite halfway. That's what, 95 meters, is it? Um, short of, of the halfway split, but still very, very close to, to the time that they were asking for at halfway. And, and the pack has whittled down yet again. What have we got in there? Two, four, six, eight, probably 10 athletes. Uh, in there with somebody else just uh, struggling off the, the back of that group and then behind that significant daylight and you can't actually see a runner back down the road. Yes, that's nine athletes. I, I think they're in that lead group with Lemma just struggling to, to stay on the back, to stay in touch with um, Gebra Selassie, that's not obviously the Gebra Selassie, but Lul uh, Gebra Selassie, who is um, hoping to make a, a big impact on this race and has good pedigree coming into it, and Mengistu as well running alongside him. Yeah, Lemma just trying to hang on at the moment. Tola has just hardly moved, has he, since the start. He looks very, very assured extremely relaxed Tura also has been right there from the start and actually the two pacemakers Kipiego and Kibito trying to keep the pace pushing on and I think that is the other pacemaker Kibrito who's dropped back to be sitting just in front of Tola so actually doing a better job of pacemaking at this stage because he's he's sitting closer to, to where the main athletes are
I suppose it's worth reminding our uh, listeners and uh, viewers that there have been instances in the past where pacemakers have actually won marathon races because they got so far ahead of the chasing pack who thought they dropped out, or at least that's what they said they thought had happened, and, uh, and the pacemakers ended up winning. And there is, of course, no rule against that. I think if, as long as you do the job that you've been asked to do uh, and get the pack through the, the, the points that you've been asked to get them to in the designated pace, there's nothing to stop you continuing on and running your race. I think probably the, the most well-known and the first to do that was the, the guy who almost beat Paul Turgat uh, in Berlin uh, when Paul set the, the world record and was still running with him through the Brandenburg Gates. And in fact, only finished one second behind him, Sammy Koska, yeah, and... Uh, uh, Tegat wasn't very happy about that, despite the fact that he set the world record. You know, I think he wanted to, you know, put it out of sight, if you like, and the fact that he had beaten by one of his mates by just one second. Well, I think the significant point is that it, it's hard to get your head around who you're racing and who you're not racing. So if you think someone's pacemaking, you're far more likely to let them push on, to let them go ahead of you. Whereas if you know that you're racing them, then you're going to, to want to keep asserting your authority over them and to know in the closing stages well i think it's probably pretty obvious once you get to 35k if someone's still there you need to start racing them because they're in it for the long run anyone in running shoes is a potential opponent i think would be the <laughs> the safest way to look at it uh, just about halfway just before halfway uh, to be exact in the women's race we're just scrolling those in that leading pack and i don't think mercury is there she is not Berka is still in there, so she is running significantly ahead of her personal best time, although I would suggest that that's up for a, a little bit of, of revision. She is a, a great caliber of athlete, She's been around for a long time and really showed her pedigree, as I say, with that 358, 1500 meters. She's run 30, 40 or thereabouts so for 10,000 meters and got medals at championship level on the track. Um, so wants to make that step up to the marathon, very motivated to come and, and run well here. She was explaining to me last night that um, if they want to have any chance of selection for Ethiopian teams, they really need to, to put it post a fast time over the marathon, and that's why so many of them want to come here uh, and race Dubai. Well, 10 years since she won the world indoor 1500 meters and uh, now running, uh, what, you know, 25 miles further. <laughs> So pretty much all the big names apart from Mergia in that leading group uh, amongst the women. And they look very comfortable, don't they, Paula? That's, um, I mean, it's impressive that they've stayed together in more in greater numbers than the men have done, which, uh, you yeah, know, the men's a much more attritional race, as he said, with every time we come back, there's somebody drops off the back of the pack. Yeah, and this pack in the men's race is starting to spread out a lot more, whereas in contrast in the women, they're still running pretty much in pairs in the road. So I think they have their set out at a pace in the women's race, which is, is, is more likely to be sustained uh, and continued into the second half, whereas I do think we're going to see some tailing off uh, in this men's race. It has to slow down just because of the sheer pace that they went out at in the first few kilometers and then maintained through the first half of this race yeah and exactly as we saw a couple of years ago and last year to maybe a slightly lesser extent exactly at this kind of point in the race just past halfway is when they really start to feel it because they went out so quickly Well, worth mentioning the uh, well we said the women's quarter record 219.31 uh, by uh, by Mergia and uh, there's only been one other occasion when uh, sub 220 has been broken here in Dubai and it does look at this point as though a, a fair number of women are on schedule to, to break that 220 mark here today um, and in, in the men's race now I think we have we have lost that third pacemaker so we're down to to two pacemakers at the front of this men's race and then behind that as they have been for so much of this race Tola controlling it with Tura on his shoulder Alan Maru is still in that pack behind uh, and then it is thinning out it's, I think it's now lost another couple of runners I think Lemma has gone back 
down the road and then a couple of other athletes as well. So it, it's whittling down and it's whittling down quickly now at this stage with each kilometre that they tick off. And I suppose I should apologise to Kibitak. I said he was the slowest of the uh, you know, half marathoners that were all in the pacemakers and he's the one who's still left there out front. Yeah, he's got his PB as well, hasn't he? Pick off on our mics. You can possibly hear the the standoff. I think we might be getting a bit of a competition here between the the local um, Dubai bagpipes and the Ethiopian cheer squad that you can <laughs> see on your screen that have been very loud and very supportive from the off in this race. And there's been very few other people here in the stand. It's starting to fill up a little bit now, and you can hear the bagpipes getting closer. I wasn't aware that um, there were uh, Dubai. Uh, nationals who could play the bagpipes, but they're doing a terrific job here. So clearly, it's not something that's exclusive to Scotland, and they are competing, as you say, with the uh, the Ethiopian fans who just increased the volume as a result. <laughs> See, they start them young. So it's down to seven seconds now inside World Record Place for the men. 24 kilometers in you say down to seven seconds but it's not really slowing down that's a 252 kilometer again for the 24th uh, kilometer yes that's give it up but he's not opened up significant daylight on the group behind him so they are going with that and it's very very fast still there we go just in case you didn't believe us so we've got the kind of equivalent of the regimental sergeant major at the front with the bat on. Then we've got the bagpipers and we've got a couple of drummers at the back as well. Someone needs to invite them to the Edinburgh military tattoo or something next year, I think. I think that's one of the things you notice in Dubai. It, it is a mix of a load of different cultures. I think it's something like only around 20% of the population are from Dubai originally. So pretty much everyone welcome, regardless of any kind of musical heritage. Back with the women, there's the Gaifer. Looking good, and she's kept Barbara in her sights pretty much from 6 a.m. this morning. And it's now, what, nearly quarter past seven. She does look as if she's concentrating on her heels, uh, on Dibaba's heels. Amazing. Yeah, and Dibaba concentrating on the heels of the pacemaker in front of her, and it's pretty much as you were, as you have been for these women uh, at this stage in the race. Every time we've come to them, it has been Dibaba running alongside, I think it, it is uh, Detaya the, the on the far side, but the same athlete she's been running alongside who is making her debut, I think over the marathon distance in this race with De Gaifer sitting behind her, a little bit of a gap back to Dessa on the other side, Dida sitting comfortably in alongside, in between or in the V formation behind De Gaifer and Tisfaya on the far side. You've got Gide in there, Tedessa. Pace through 21 kilometers was pretty, pretty much uh, what they'd asked for. So I think it was round about 69, 47 through the 21 kilometers, so would have been just around or under the, the 70 that they asked for. Uh, and then they're settling in, slowed a little bit in that 20 second kilometer to 3.22, but it's still still around that 2.20 pace, which is what they're aiming for. And then we'll see some more of these women start to move up to fire there on the near side, starting to make her move forward in this race, but nobody significantly making any sort of inroads or pushing ahead of the pacemakers at this point as you would expect because they're quite happy to, to be running along at this pace and they will probably start to, to pick it up from 25 kilometers maybe. I think the woman on the far side, the taller woman is De Cabo and she's a, a marathon debutante and 69-10 uh, half marathon and she's just done that hasn't she? Yes pretty much. <laughs> I mean you look at those in the leading group without Mergia 
and you would have to think De Barber should now be a massive favourite. I mean, look at the her uh, quickest time, 219.52. Uh, Mergia, uh, 219.31. So about 20 seconds quicker in terms of a personal best. But I mean, De Gaefer, who won last year, uh, she's about three minutes slower in terms of a PB. So you have to think it's De Barber's potentially De Barber's race to lose, even though we're only halfway. Yeah, although if you look at the look of determination on the face of, of De Gaefer, I would say that she's definitely come here aiming to, to retain her title and to, to make big inroads on her personal best and big improvements on her personal best. It will have stung a little bit that she ran so well and then if she was injured and unable to, to race in the autumn, that will be a lot of frustration to put it in your winter's training to come at back, back here to Dubai and, and see what you can do. As we get an idea now, 2.54 for the 25th kilometre in the men's race. So maintaining that schedule and, and nobody else has dropped off the back. So they're, they're all hanging in there for the moment. 2.54 for the 25th kilometre. 2.52, wow. This is really, really quick. Still got around about, few, even if you take out the pacemakers, seven or eight in that uh, leading group. Just a question of how long they can keep this going for. Well, marathon runners will often say that the uh, the race begins at 35k, and uh, that's that's when it begins to get uh, attritional. I'm very impressed with Kibitak. He's really done a terrific job here for a guy that's uh, just said his personal best for the half marathon, and uh, he shows no uh, no signs of slowing down. Tall figure of Toller is just third behind Kipiego, so he's uh, he's still maintaining his his ascendancy over the. Uh, yeah, the racers, if you like, given that Kibitok and Kipiego are the pacemakers. 257, the most recent kilometre. Well, sorry about the picture uh, break up here. Obviously, uh, a few problems with the. Uh, the micro uh, signal from the the motorbikes. But we got, have we got a brief look at? Uh, well, we, they, we were trying to get a, a close up of Tola, who just does look very very easy behind the pacemaker Kibitok there. Doesn't he just trying to defend the title that he won last year in such confident style? And he's one of those athletes that just hardly ever seems to have a below par race. Not lately, anyway. So that just gives you an idea of the little entourage that follows uh, the leading group, the car that shows them the time, uh, the motorbikes, which bring you these pictures. There's our intrepid cameraman perched on the back of the bike, rather him than me. Got to trust your driver to do that job, haven't you, really? So single file for the men through well, nearly a, an hour and 20. And it looks as if uh, Kip Yego has uh, dropped back or dropped out and we're reliant now on uh, Kibitok. Uh, but he's, uh, he's staying at his uh, pace manfully and still checking that he's on the, uh, on the right time. Well, only one kilometre outside uh, three minutes, and that was only 3.01, but uh, so some t terrific fast running here. And that is Alamaru now back behind the um, psychedelic flashing lead car, um, dropping back down the road. As we see now, Marcel, who coming down the straight towards the finish, you can't actually see him from here, so I'm trying to work out how far from the finish line he is but a very very quick time as we had indicated might happen here today and seems to be well ahead in this race yep the silver bullet as they call them looks to be home and hosed effectively 
the first time that he has raced here in Dubai. He is a nine-time world champion, so I guess we shouldn't really be overly surprised. He's a double Olympic gold medalist. I'm just trying to work out the time. It's around about uh, 1.20 there or thereabouts. The world record is 1.20.14. And he may well be inside that. We'll have to get... No, it's just outside. Of course, they started five minutes before seven. That was uh, before six. That was what confused me. But still, a brilliant victory for the Swiss. In just an hour and 25 and change. And a clenched fist that tells you exactly how he feels about it. And it's very difficult to see anyone behind him at this point. It's like he's absolutely decimated the field here. Well, I think he was always going to be the favourite for this race when the others persuaded him what a good course it was and how, how flat it was and how smooth the tarmac was. And uh, well, he's, he certainly won this race by at least two or three minutes. So back with the elite men and our single remaining pacemaker. He's almost getting annoyed, isn't he? He's like, come on, guys, I'm, I'm still running the pace that you asked me and you're not going with it. Why aren't you going with it? Well, I think they're finding it a little bit hard work at this point and concentrating now on getting it right over the second half of this race. Um, any sudden surges or, or moves made too fast at this point will definitely cause damage in the closing stages. So it needs to be gradual increases and they really need to be in tune with their own bodies, know exactly where they are in regards to, to that fine line that you can you can go over very easily in a marathon and just produce too much debris and lactic acid in your body that your body can't handle and can't get rid of and, and keep moving in, in the second stage of the second half of this marathon and they can't even be thinking about times at this point can they i mean there's with with half a dozen guys in there it's you know who's going to be first This is Yamamoto, the Japanese, coming home in second place in the wheelchair event. And as Pat was saying, he's going to be fully two minutes behind Hoog, but still a very decent performance. 127.20, so yeah, pretty much exactly two minutes off Hoog's pace. And uh, no sign yet of the third place behind Yamamoto. Try and nip back and see that if we can. So still, Dibaba <laughs> in the middle of your shot, and right behind her, the defending champion, Worknish de Gaper, where she's been the entire race so far. Well, I've just got a message here. It seems that Mergia has dropped out, which I, I, th I think we presumed, but uh, I'm not sure at what, uh, at what kilometre. Well, that'll be a big disappointment for her. Just scrolling the latest positions for you amongst the women. That still is a very big pack of women, as we see Dababa again struggling to, to get a drink. You'd think the amount of experience that she had, she would have got a little bit better at, at, at finding her drink on those tables. It is the same table for each one, so the athletes at the technical meeting the night before are given a plan telling them exactly which of the, thing, I think, eight tables out there today uh, their drinks bottle will be in uh, on and which position it will be at on that table so they should be able to to get to their bottle and find it fairly easily you can see some of the athletes will decorate their bottle to enable them to locate it a little bit more easily uh, the japanese athletes actually used to put a hoop over the top so they could run along slide their arm through the hoop uh, and then keep running and get their bottle so they were very very well drilled and well skilled uh, uh, finding and, and locating their bottle and you can see as we look at the Burj Al Arab they're building there just how much of a haze or mist there is around this morning uh, whether that's going to have any impact on this race it certainly doesn't look as though it's having a significant impact on the times that they're running so far well i suppose paula that you were you were always so far ahead that you didn't have to worry about uh, bumping into people to get your water bottles <laughs> 
Yeah, just mean, it is difficult. I've, I've had a couple that have dropped. Um, your hand can slip on the bottle, and uh, we've seen it happen so many times. And you, I think it was DeBarbera in one of the London marathons actually went back to get her bottle because you are faced with that dilemma if you miss it. Do you go back and get it? It's very important in the early stages, particularly in the first half of the marathon, to make sure that you stay well fueled and well hydrated. Uh, humidity, as we've talked about, it's not hot out here today, but it is quite humid, so they will be losing fluid. And so trying to, to keep that on board. It, it is a skill and it's something that also needs to be mastered. It's something that the likes of Mo Farah will have to work on as they move up towards the marathon is getting that drink, being able to drink while running at significant pace uh, and your body being able to absorb as much of it as you can. Just a brief word, if you have um, watched our coverage over the past few years, you probably remember some quite dramatic aerial shots that we brought you. Well, unfortunately, we're not allowed to send the helicopter up today because it's just too misty. So although we've got an ace pilot, he's not allowed uh, to get the chopper up. So that's why you're not seeing any aerial shots, in case you're wondering. Just going back to, we, you, we've been talking about Mo Farah. There's someone else I want to talk to you about, Paul, in terms of um, the women's marathon in particular. Uh, Gwen Jorgensen, who, for those who don't know, is a multiple triathlon world champion, a phenomenal runner, and she has decided to quit triathlon because she wants to try and win a gold medal uh, at the, by winning the marathon in the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. Now, first of all, I think it's a pretty brave decision. Um, what do you think of her chances? And uh, were you quite surprised that someone who's clearly brilliant at her primary sport is, is making the move to marathon running? Um, I guess a little bit. Uh, she has shown her pedigree as we, as we look back and on your screens, you're seeing, I think it's third, fourth and fifth come in in the wheelchair race. Um, but getting back to, to Gwen, I mean, she's shown her pedigree. She's raced well over 10 miles. She raced the New York Marathon uh, and ran, I think, 241 there that's a big jump to to talk about making that leap up to olympic medal territory uh, in the women's marathon do you want to talk in there yeah we'll just just leave that for the moment and watch the uh, conclusion to the the battle for third as we go to today as well further on the uh, So Ernst Van Dyke it is finishing third. Ten time Boston Marathon winner. So that's your one, two, three now. In the wheelchair race. Probably the strongest field that they've ever had. And as you can see, there is a, a genuine spirit of camaraderie there after the uh, the effort that they put in over the last hour and a half or so. So that's the first one, two, three of the day decided. Of course, the elite men have got another half an hour plus out there, and the elite women slightly longer. Just going back to Gwen Jorgensen um, briefly, Paula. She ran, I think, around about 240, didn't she, in New York? She's going to have to improve massively on that if she wants to have any chance of getting a medal. Yes, she is. I mean, New York isn't a fast course, so you've already got to think there's probably five, six minutes um, easily made up there just by running on a, a quicker course but still that's that's a big leap to to talk about being world class over the marathon i mean it's something we've seen before can the, the example of carolina kluft who was do so so dominant in the women's heptathlon and then decided she was going to go and concentrate on individual events long jump for her personal satisfaction and that may be what, what gwen's decided to do she's really almost without rival in the triathlon and maybe she just wants to to taste that comp competition a little bit more and to see what she can do over the marathon distance i think time will tell and first job for her is going to be getting herself into the territory where she can even think about making an american team to go to the olympic games before she can talk about trying to make uh, olympic medals it'll be a fascinating story that plays out over the next uh, two and a half years or so as we head towards tokyo 2020 Still a very large group of women leading the way, and we're nearly an hour and a half in now. You can see them approaching the 27 kilometer mark. Berker towards the back with Gudetta. 
Desai right in the mix. Cissé Jessa we haven't talked about either, and she uh, is in that leading group. Fourth here last year with the second fastest time of her career. She has won a marathon previously in uh, Rangzhou in 2013. Now we get a view from the other side, as you can see the, the splits clicking through there, just that tantalizing one second outside of the um, 220 barrier, which is just adding up, adding up. But they did have that margin from the first half. So very consistent uh, and very good running by a lot of these women. Now we can see on that side that that is uh, Rosa de Gera who has been running alongside Debaba for much of this race. And as I talked about earlier, she races a lot. Last year, she raced Dubai in January, then on to Vienna in April and Shanghai in November. And so that's only, what, 11 weeks from now. And so she's bouncing back from a very, very good performance there, a personal best of 222 in Dubai, and clearly has recovered well to be running at the front for so much of this race and looking so comfortable alongside Mara Debaba. Well, let's hope they stay together for a long time. We get some kind of a, of a thrilling finish with those two, or uh, a couple from in behind, because there are some decent sprinters there as well. If Jababa uh, and potentially De Gaifa can't get away at some point. Well, you've still got Tefera sitting in that pack, and she's got a 14, 28, 29, five kilometer time. So easily the, the class of this field, if you like, if it comes down to that final sprint for the line although a sprint in a marathon i will caution is not the same as the sprint on the track and what you have left in your legs in the closing stages of a marathon is very very different to what you might have in the last lap of a 5000 meters on the track so from the women to the men and uh, our pacemaker seems to be going further away every time we get a shot of the leaders <laughs> This is when alarm bells might start ringing if you're in that pack there. When you start to, to get past 25K, I'd say certainly when you get past 30K, if that pacemaker's still out ahead, although he is looking around, he's definitely checking on the, the pack behind him. But if he stays out that far ahead, this is the point where he's thinking, you know what, should I just carry on? I feel good here, I'm gonna just keep going. Well, there have been several examples of it in the past, you know, where they're asked to go to 25K, 30K, or even 35 when the the, the race is supposed to really begin and uh, you know I mean what has he got now 20 25 30 probably maybe 50 meters at the moment he's certainly not doing a pacing job there well the only thing worthwhile worth mentioning is that the pacemakers do get a significant bonus if they do a pacemaking job in a world record attempt so he has a vested interest in not only getting to the the points that he's been asked to get to in the designated time but in making sure that there are some guys with him who have a, a very good chance of, of going on to to hit that world record so that i think that's why he's trying to to pull them on he can sense that they may be slipping back a little bit and he's trying to to encourage them on as as well as he can at this stage in the race but there's not a huge amount of interest from that pack behind him Well, there is that pack with the big names in it. Tola, who's just hardly moved a muscle in terms of just staying exactly where he wants to be for an hour and a half plus. He looks extremely composed. I don't think he's going to be bothered at the moment with the pacemakers uh, clear. Tura, who's running an impressive race for, for one so young and so inexperienced at this distance. There's Lemmer at the back, he's done well to hang on. Looked like he was struggling a bit earlier. Well, Talda did say that he'd like to run at under 2.04 this year, which means that he's exactly 30 minutes away from the finish if, uh, if he's going to prove, uh, prove himself right. Well, you don't imagine he's going to be far away from it either way. Just missed it by a, a whisker last year. It was 11 seconds outside. Uh, going inside 204. And significant too, I think, when you're running a marathon, often you enter that last half an hour and you think, okay, I can do this. Uh, a half an hour run is what a lot of these guys will do on their recovery runs. Um, so it, it's something that's completely manageable, but when you have pushed your body to the limit in the first hour and a half of the race, then it, it's a different story and half an hour can feel like a, a very long time to, to be hanging on and there's still 
a lot of significant racing to be done in this race to, to really sort these men out from another, one another. Well, for our older viewers, uh, Jim Hogan, an Irish guy that ran in Britain for many, many years, he won the European Marathon in 1966. And he used to train down along the uh, the Thames out at Richmond, and he said that uh, he was really suffering. It was pretty hot championships, um, you know, uh, in uh, well, what's that over? Well, over 40 years, 50 years ago, and he said he just visualised running along the last half a dozen miles along the River Thames towards uh, towards Kew and uh, you know, the haven of the gardens and uh, I mean is that something that you ever had to do you know this is just a training run the last half an hour uh, yes and no I mean I think definitely I would think that when I got into the last half an hour okay this is half an hour I can do this I can I can get through this but in terms of the focus I mean on training runs your mind can be drifting all over the place uh, and in a race you have to be very very focused on the splits, I used to like to, to really map out the closing stages of the race in, in my mind. So to know where, yes, where a mile to go. Big Ben is, is 1,200 meters to go, so 1,200 meters to go from there. Uh, and really kind of get gauge it really well so you're getting every last ounce of energy out of your body in the closing stages of the race. But these guys are away from that at this point so now it is about trying to almost take your mind away from the pain that is certainly coming from parts of your body and just to focus on what you need to focus on so making sure that you get those vital drink station bottles and that you tick off those kilometers and really count down and that's nice in the marathon when you get to the point where instead of counting up you're counting down and you're you're starting to sense the finish line drawing closer so Lemmon's gone to the uh, front of that little group. Men's do on the left as we look, the guests in behind. Well, that is enthusiasm and stamina. Uh, it is almost equally as impressive as the runners because they've been there doing that since before six o'clock this morning. They're here every year. And they pretty much know an Ethiopian's going to win the men's and the women's race, don't they? Yeah, they've got a very good uh, chance and very good odds on that. But they are a, an Ethiopian cheer squad you see all over the world. Wherever there is a, a, a huge, uh, big road race going on or any kind of race, there will be an Ethiopian cheer squad with some drums uh, and with some singing going on there. I think they used to follow Haile Gebrselassie around wherever. And a big reflection on the fact that, as we were saying earlier, Athletics uh, and road running is the number one sport in Ethiopia and much as you'll see I guess English football fans follow their team all around you'll see the Ethiopian cheer squad follow the Ethiopian athletes wherever they are in the globe. Of course the difference is that the England football fans have not an earthly whether their team's going to win or not whereas these people know they're going to be celebrating uh, in about half an hour's time. Well, the next big international event on the uh, the calendar is the World Indoor Championships in Birmingham in the UK at the beginning of March, and uh, yeah, a contingent will be there for sure. Well, you can see the pacemaker has dropped out, so it's down to the class of the field, if you like, now to sort it out between them. It's seven or eight in that leading group. Most of the names that you would have expected to see are there. Well, we haven't seen the kilometre times for uh, for the last couple of K, and uh, it, it does look a, a, a little bit more sedate. But it's much more interesting now because these guys are in a race. Yeah, you know, they're into the last seven or eight kilometres, and uh, I mean they're starting to get wary, obviously, aren't they? Yeah, and they're starting to, to definitely feel the pace and to look around also within that pack and see who else who else is still there, who's been able to, to hang with this. A lot of these guys will train together as well, so they'll be used to running alongside each other and they'll be used to kind of picking up the signs for when one another, when the other guys are hurting, when they're pushing close to their limit and when they're still got a little bit left and they're still running within themselves. I think Toll is still looking very 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 good Tura has been there throughout the race and, and is really 
looking smooth. Mengistu is starting to look a little bit more laboured, I think, than he did earlier in the race, but it, it's inevitable at this point that these guys are going to look as though they're working hard because they are working very, very hard. And how much does the psychology of it come into play, Paul? I mean, this kind of stage of a race, we're an hour and 40 minutes in, there's a leading group of seven, up... Other runners kind of looking across, thinking oh, he looks he looks like he's relaxed. Oh, he looks like he might be struggling a bit. There must be some of that goes on. Yeah, there's definitely um, mind games that, that, that go on within the race. I mean, when they're running at a very, very fast pace, maybe less so than a slower race. Um, a slower pace as we get a look at the what they're calling a very tight turn, but which in comparison to the hairpin turns that they had, for example, on the World Championship course in London, it isn't significantly tight and it hasn't really slowed these guys down as they've gone around that but they will be yeah looking at each other assessing trying to for example when they go and pick up their drinks bottles making it look really easy maybe offering it around a, a little bit to say okay uh, I, I don't need this I'm fine I'm doing really well are you um, but less so than it would be in, in a slow race where you're starting to almost play a cat and mouse game and wait for someone to make a move. These guys have committed, they've made their move, they've shown that they believe they're in shape by going with this pace and by still being there at this stage in the race. So I think there's a respect as well as a mind games going on. They, these guys respect each other, that they're all still there at this pace and they will start now maybe to even help each other out a little bit in terms of working together. The pacemaker's gone, so they'll work together to, to try and keep it on the pace. But it is Tola who has been controlling this really from the start, and he's now pushing it on a little bit and seeing who else amongst that group is able to go with it. Well, I won't mention any names here, but a couple of Irish internationals who used to uh, train together, um, you know, middle and long distance uh, runners, and uh, one guy uh, said of his colleague, this guy never used to sweat. He said it was amazing. It really used to annoy me. He said, but when he did, he said he'd just get a spot in the center of his T-shirt, right you know, in the middle of his chest. And he said, and I always thought, OK, now I've got you. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. i tell you what, the performance so far of uh, Seifu Tour is really impressive. We talked about um, his inexperience at, at, at this level. But, I mean, you look at some of his times, PB for a half marathon, nigh on 63 minutes. He's run 29.05 for 10,000. That was in, in high altitude. But this is kind of uncharted territory for him, really, in a race of this calibre, with all due respect to, to the marathon field in Seoul. And he's still right there with, what, half less than half an hour to go. Just over seven kilometers left to go. Oh, and then Mengistu caused a little bit of trouble as he cut across to try and get his bottle. I think Toller is okay, but he was certainly impeded within that. I'm trying to see, has he got it? Has he managed to pick up his own bottle in the middle of all that fracas? Because that I think Mengistu realized a little bit too late. Uh, you can see Valentin, one of the managers there, make, trying to make sure that his athletes have got their drinks bottles as they've come through there but yeah i think that maybe crept up on them a little bit that 35k drink station a couple of the guys caught unawares and panicked a little bit trying to to cut across and we've seen fallers in the past at drink stations it, it, it can be a, a tricky and dangerous area to negotiate and hopefully they've all come through that unscathed well he looks okay um Tyler, but that was a, a potentially anxious moment Let's just have another look at it. You see Taylor there on the right. Went right into the, the runner in front of him. It could have been a, a end of race, basically. And it still could be significant. I think when you're you're forced to, to check yourself, break and twist as, as he did there, then that's dangerous for hamstrings that are already starting to cramp up, um, quads that can be too. So hopefully he's okay. We'll, we'll get an idea now in the next couple of kilometers. If, if damage has been done there, then it will start to show. So next two up front from Legesse. Young Mentura in behind. Tola at the back of that pack now. And it must have disrupted his rhythm, even if it hasn't you know, physically done any damage. Well, let's hope he can get that rhythm back. He's still in touch, which is the main thing. Well, I 
suppose the best example of what looked like a cataclysmic fall was uh, the great Finn Lassie Virain, who actually was bowled over during the Olympic 10,000 metres. The first gold medal that he had won at 10K, he got up, broke the world record and won the gold medal. Yeah, I, I remember seeing Alistair Brown in a triathlon get, fall down in South Africa and get up and win. I thought you were going to talk about um, Zola Budd and Mary Decker-Slaney for a minute, but that, that wasn't something she was able to recover from. And, of course, neither of them won. Indeed. Well, Decker didn't even finish, of course. Still that big pack in the women's race. Still Berka looking very, very comfortable in there. I'm looking to see if Teferi is still in there. Still the Gafer. Can you see Dubarba? Is Dubarba got? Now either Mara Dubarba has dropped off that group or she's slightly ahead of that group because I can't see her in it on that shot at the moment and she had looked so comfortable for so much of the race up to this point. Malaise is still there, De Gaefer is still there, Tedes is on the far side, Rosa Tejera is still there, Dida, Tess Fai, but I can't see any sign of Mara de Barba. Well that's a big shock potentially if uh, de Barba is out of contention because every time we've looked at that leading women's group She's appeared to be very relaxed and, and not having a problem. I guess as soon as you take anything for granted in this sport, it's potentially problematic. But that leading group significantly fewer women in it than we've seen for most of the race. As you'd expect at this point because it is starting to, to whittle down but um, I could see one of the pacemakers just drifted over to the far side of the road and was looking back at, and looking around so maybe it was Dubarba he was looking for maybe not um, but he was certainly having a look to assess who is it left in this group uh, and maybe what pace he should continue to, to keep it moving along at. Well, we've told you already that uh, Mergia, the three-time uh, champion here, is out the race. It looks as though Dibaba, even if she's not out the race, is out of contention. They haven't actually had a look at any of the... Um, recent splits from this women's race either to to get some idea of, of whether the pace is maintained or whether it has dropped off a little bit i would suggest that it has been maintained if not picked up because it has whittled down and there are certainly fewer women in that group than the last time that we came to it and de barbara is not there so there have been some significant changes in this pack just incidentally you could see two of the girls there passing the drinks bottle um, between themselves. I think the rules have now been relaxed a little bit. You didn't used to be able to, to pass drinks bottles. Now you can so long as it isn't consistent, which the wording's a little bit ambiguous, but I think it means that you can't consistently go and get a drinks bottle for somebody else and hand it to them. So a little bit as a domestique would do in a, in a cycling race. That can't happen, but if you do see that someone has dropped their bottle, you are allowed now to hand it to them. Well, Tola is back at the front of uh, that group, so that, uh, uh, that, that push, if you like, or that, that stumble that, um, you know, that he was forced into by uh, Mingus Stu uh, doesn't seem to have affected him at this juncture. I guess is still looking very comfortable in that group as well. It's very, very hard to tell by looking at their faces just how hard these guys are working. Um, I think 
Maybe it is something that's particular to, to Ethiopian runners, but they do always look very, very relaxed and in control, even when they're not, as it were, even when they're struggling to stay with it. But you can see as they go through 37 kilometers, the 258, so the pace has slowed and they've slipped outside of that world record by about a minute now. So it puts them around, right around that 2-4 uh, marker, which is maybe why Tola is starting to, to move to the front. He was very keen. To, to break through that 204 barrier. So if he's going to do that, he's going to have to get moving and start pushing along now. It'll be a great effort if he does from here, uh, because technically it'll mean just under 14 more minutes of running to complete the 2018 Dubai Marathon. And he's going to have to do most of the work himself, it seems. The main priority, of course, is winning the race. He wants to defend that that title and he's put himself in absolutely pole position to do exactly that right at the business end of proceedings here. I mean do you think uh, Paula that it makes any difference that this guy's proved himself as a medalist at the Olympic Games a medalist at the World Championships and uh, and a winner here last year I mean would you say that you know, people who've proved themselves winners in the past are, uh, have got to be p favorites however marginal yeah, I think they definitely come in w with an edge. I mean, I think probably the best example of that is Mo Farah and the way that he almost seems to to dominate psychologically the rest of the field when he comes to a final on the track. It'll be a different story in the marathon um, and he'll have to re-establish himself there to have any chance of having that sort of control, if you like, over the rest of the field. But I think amongst the guys in that pack, there is definitely a respect for Tola, for what he's achieved on the track and for the way he's translated that to the marathon. In contrast to that, it's very different to this, this stage in the race last year when he really was the kind of the only one surviving that fast early pace. Here he's got a lot of company around him, a lot of people who have been able to, to absorb that and to live with it. So in his mind, he's got to be asking those questions, how much have they got left? But they are also almost looking to him to make the first move at this point in the race because he is the one that they respect and the one that they would expect to make a move. If he doesn't make it soon, then one of them might just try their own hand. Well, he certainly hasn't got away. He might be just quite content to do this for another couple of kilometers or so. Only on the right we know has a quick time, or quickish time, not as fast as Tola. Next to and Legesse just in behind. Just under three minutes for kilometer number 38. Well, Mengistu is currently running at about four minutes better than his personal best, so uh, that, that's already some effort on his uh, on his behalf. And we've still got um, Lul Gebrselassi as well on, on the far side, who's making his debut. Does have that 59.18 half marathon pedigree, so for him it's been a walk in a park for that first um, half of, of this race and he's certainly handling his first marathon very very well and starting to put himself right up there maybe amongst the the favorites in in this group as they come into the closing stages back to the women's race still test five still uh rosa derasia there and still de Gefa on the far side galeta burka also still looking very very good and certainly Running, got to be running close to a personal best, I would say, for her in that race and acquitting herself very, very well in this marathon. So having negotiated the turn, leading women head towards the last, uh, what, four or five kilometres. The sun is coming up now, but um, it's probably a degree or so warmer than it was when we uh, we began. But it's uh, 
it, it, it's still not a, a searing heat that's really going to make any uh, significant difference at this point. Not at all. I think it's very good conditions uh, for marathon running out there. As the sun comes up, that humidity has probably started to, to drop a little bit. It certainly feels like that standing here and maybe more comfortable conditions, although for the women as the, and the men as the race is, is wearing on. Of course, it's getting tougher and tougher for them as it inevitably would do. It was interesting just, just watching the I think it was Tess Fire just trying to, to squeeze through the middle of the two runners in front of her as if, as if there's not enough road around to, to go around the outside and as she's trying to just um, squeeze her way through the middle. But I think it, it's very um, indicative of the, the training conditions that these Ethiopian women and the Ethiopian men train in on a lot of times on very, very narrow trails where they do run just single file all the time so they're just focusing on the heels of the runner in front and when they come to races they seem to just slot into that mindset very very easily we saw rosa derege in that leading group of women only a second appearance here she was sixth 12 months ago she's on the last two shanghai marathons and she actually took five minutes off her personal best uh, in that race in 2016 2.22.43 PB now. Berker towards the uh, back of that group. Well, she could be running about five minutes faster than she's ever run as a marathon before. We're about 24, 25 minutes from the end of this women's race. to get an idea from that 35k split and I, I think they are still certainly on if not just under uh, 220 pace in this women's race and running very very strongly so so Rosa Dereja is certainly on pace to, to significantly challenge and improve her personal best as is Galeta Verka behind that hers is only 226 so that's definitely up for revision out there today so back with the men uh, an hour and 57 in. Well, no dramas for Toda that time at the uh, water table. Littman Gistu at the front now. And just asking a few questions with probably only about six or seven minutes of running to go now. can see the first questions being asked by Mangistu and you can see the others looking around Toure is the first really to significantly fall off that pack that's been together for the last couple of kilometers which is no real surprise given his inexperience no not really at all but Tola very significantly reacted quite quickly to to that kind of stretch out by Mangistu I don't think it was a significant break yet maybe they were waiting until they've cleared this 40 kilometer drink station so the last of their um, personalized drinks if you like the ones that they've been able to hand in the night before that have what they've practiced in training uh, in them so they are able to get those personal drinks now and now the real la racing happens in the last two kilometers well that mist has really uh, risen now but it does put me in mind of the 2013 race when we had five guys emerging from the mist in the last street it was a, it was a different finish back then about a, kilo, a kilometer away from here but that's the best collective finish that i've ever seen in the uh, the 20 odd uh, or the 19 years of this uh, dubai race and potentially we've got a uh, a similar scenario coming up here Well, it's going to be fascinating finale, that is for sure. Yeah, it wasn't really a searching question that Mengistu asked, was it, with that little break? It was more of a kind of a polite inquiry. And it was answered in the affirmative by the likes of Tola, I guess, eh?
I mean, Gebra Selassie there, I think, still looks pretty good. Shadowing Tola. Tola, you can see, well, starting to, to focus a little bit more. He's looked very, very lax, as most of them have um, throughout the race, but he's, Mungistu actually looks as though he's working the hardest with that look of determination. So he gets his head down, and maybe he knows that this is the point he has to make this surge, because if the other guys are still there coming into the last kilometre or so, maybe he feels that this is his best chance now to, to really try and make it a, a, a long wind-up from here on in to, to the finish. Two hours into the race, and there are still six good men and true in that leading group. And we haven't mentioned uh, Lemmer of late. He's done really well to hang on in there because he was apparently struggling earlier, and he's uh, got a very good CV in terms of previous performances in Dubai. Third here last year. He's at a fifth, a fourth, and a third in the back of that group, but not far off the pace. And at this juncture, you know, personal bets don't count for anything. I mean, this yeah. is just a, a, a race to the death now between these uh, this sextet. It hasn't been a, an impressive race of survival as well, given how fast they went. It's certainly in the first five kilometres, but in the first half of this race. And Tola now goes back to the front and raises a, an even bigger cheer from the Ethiopian uh, cheer squad here at the finish who are watching on the big screen. Just looking around to see where the main danger was lurking. Tamarat Tola. And now he's the one asking the questions. And Gistu looks to be struggling a little bit. Lama trying to come on the left-hand side of your screen. That's a... A really good effort from him. And Garamu on the right also looking good. This is good. This could be an absolute thrilling finish here. This is where Tola also has an advantage because he knows the course. And, and when they know the course in the closing stages of this race, that hasn't changed with the revisions they've made to the uh, course this year. So he's run this a couple of times now. He knows how to get it right in the run onto the finish, and the others are looking to him a little bit to, to let him dictate that, but Gevremo is still looking good. Well, it's still very hard to call it. Gevremo in the orange, Tola on the far side as we look. And once they uh, make the turn, they have about 500 metres to go. And Lemmer trying to veer up on the shoulder of Tola. Gebri Selassie looking strong on the left now. And Geremu hasn't finished either. And now Tola just going to have to really focus here because they're laying down the gauntlet to him and Gebri Selassie looks the strongest of the four, maybe. Gebri Selassie, Geremu, Lemma and Tola. It looks to be between those four. And they're almost side by side. Look at this. Gebri Selassie on the left could just be ahead, but it's very hard to tell, and there isn't much in it. Tola is really struggling. Geremu coming. Tola, Gebri Selassie. Gebri Selassie. And Geremu almost stride for stride, and Tola straining to try and get to them. Lemmer is back and forth at the moment. Haven't seen a finish like this for a long, long time. Geremu in the middle, Tola on the right, Gebri Selesi digging in for all these words. But it's Geremu who has the advantage now. He's asking all the questions. He's a couple of yards clear and trying to go away. Gebri Selassie is the only man who can run him down, but he's not going to do it. This is a phenomenal performance. Inside, two minutes with 2004. Terrible wins. Gebri Selassie, that's a really good display from him. Another shot result in the Dubai Marathon. What a finish that was. 
Well, I talked about the 2013 finish being uh, being good, but that was absolutely terrific. That's the best best finish I've ever seen in uh, in the Dubai Marathon. And Garamu deserved that, didn't he? He was, you see, he was fighting as much maybe to try and dip under the 204, but certainly to get that course record as he was to, to get the victory. But he was, maybe didn't even notice the clock given the battle that he was in to, to get to that, that finish line. He kept his powder dry for so much of that race, really didn't make any moves until that final one in the final straight. It's amazing, isn't it? Now this race just continues to close up surprising results. That was another one. And in a really good time as well. We were talking about Gabriel Selassie on more than one occasion. You thought you always thought he was going well for the yeah, I did. I mean, I think when you come in with the pedigree that he came in with over the half marathon distance, when you've got a 59-18 in your legs and you're still there in the closing stages, then you've got to be in with a good chance. And I think he thought he did, but he was just caught out, if you like, by just how much Garamu had left and how much he was able to, to fight and to raise it in that closing straight. I don't think um, that Gabriel Selassie finished badly by any means. He ran extremely well. And, well, obviously he's running personal best because it's his debut, but he's running <laughs> probably, I'm not sure what the fastest debut of the time ever is, but I think he's probably got to be close to that with that run there today. And you can see Titola gave it everything. Maybe he just controlled it and tried to stamp his authority on it a little bit too much in the second half of that race, but he just didn't have quite enough in his legs to, to be able to, to live with those other two guys in, in, in the closing stages of the race. Well, I mentioned earlier on that Garamu ran 2.06.12 in only his third ever marathon in Berlin. So it, 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 he keeps on progressing. And that is a real warning for the likes of Kometo and others that there's a new kid on the block. Brilliant performance from him. Well, Tola looked pretty disconsolate on the floor there, yet he's done everything that he promised to do but uh, finished third. Absolutely left nothing out there. Just beaten on the day by by two better men, I guess you'd have to say. And just look at this huge, huge gap behind those uh, those guys. Still nobody else in the finishing straight at this juncture. So the leading women. are around about you know, 13 minutes or so from hitting the tape on the line and Tedesse and Tesfe and Rosa Derege we mentioned who's right up there looks like six of them with um, Tesfe trying desperately to hang on at the back and the uh, three pre-race favourites have uh, all gone uh, by the board. Mergia dropped out. Uh, we're pretty sure De Barba uh, must have dropped out too. We still have De Gaefer in there, though, who is the defending champion and still looking good at this stage, though I would say that Rosa Dereja is, is, is looking very, very... She's just sat there the whole race looking very composed, slightly higher arm carriage than the other... Um, girls around her in that race that's not that unusual I guess Mary Katani is also known for running with quite a high arm carriage and it, it's it's what she's used to and it's working very well for her to this point well we know that the men's course record has gone I wonder whether the women can do the same 2 1931 is the course record for the women as Gabri Selassie finished a, a very creditable second.
Lisa still in third in that place, was third in this race last year, so she also has um, the knowledge of this course that we were talking about that De Gepa has, and um, that probably is going to be significant uh, amongst these women who knows this course well and who can and judge it right, because as, as we saw in, in the men's race just a few moments ago, judging it to perfection when there's still four women together at this stage in the race is going to be important. It's looking a bit clearer now at uh, Seven Star Hotel, the Burj Al Arab. Shrouded in mist earlier, but two hours and ten minutes into the race, we can finally see it in all its glory. This is promising to, promising to be as good a finish as in the uh, men's race and uh, I think we can safely say it's going to be an Ethiopian woman who's going to win as well as an Ethiopian man if not top three too. Yeah, their dominance is <laughs> almost ridiculous at times. It's the Rege up the front. And Lisa just on the right hand side in the orange vest just looking back down the, the road there you can still see just in the background in the um, yellow calf socks the bright yellow calf socks is Galeta Berka so she's still hanging in I mean that's too far now for even a 358 1500 meter runner to have a, a chance uh, of making that back up on this lead group, but she still has had a very, very good run there today. Well, it looks like three medals to be decided by the four of them, or between the four of them. And De Gaefer, right where she would want to be. She's seen Mergia fall by the wayside, De Barba fall by the wayside, but she's still got work to do. And that is the 40 kilometer drink stations going by they were running by there so it means two kilometers to go which means they are on sub 220 pace so course record is definitely on and personal best for i think all of these women Rosa Dereja now almost urging on Namo, the pacemaker, trying to get him to, to push on a little bit. I think if she's going to push on at this stage, she's going to have to do that on her own now. And it's the time to, to be striking out and, and doing the work on your own as they approach now the 40 kilometer mark. So and they go over here, that is exactly two kilometers, 195 meters to go. Well, the gap is going to absolutely obliterate her personal best, 222.36, but more importantly, from her point of view, it's whether she can outmaneuver these other three women and defend the title that she won so memorably and surprisingly 12 months ago. Well, a minor point: the uh, the pacemaker himself is only a 2:26 marathoner, so he's actually running a personal best too. So he might as well finish. Yeah, he could move off to the side a bit, though, couldn't he, and let the women race it out uh, a little bit amongst themselves. It looks as though Tedesco's struggling to go with it. Her split through the 40 kilometer was uh, still with these women, but uh, she's dropped out of the shot now. So it looks like the medals have been decided, but how those medals are going to pan out is still very much up to be played for. Well, he still looks like he's enjoying himself, that pacemaker, doesn't he? He's been grinning around <laughs> at the, uh, the three women with him. And it looks as though he's looking around now and actually giving information to uh, Dereja about who's, who's left there at the moment. And it is Malesa who's sitting r right behind him. I don't know if he's even aware. He has to turn right around almost um, 180 degrees to be able to, to see that she's there in his slipstream and still with them at the moment but it looks now to be down to these two it does indeed that the last kind of five or six hundred meters um, has put these two uh, ahead of the other two that are in that leading group and you've got to say Rosa Dereja looks absolutely superb at the moment after 
nearly two and a quarter hours. There is clear daylight between her and her nearest pursuers. And if you look at those um, 5K splits up on the screen there, you can see how that race has progressed in contrast to the men's race. This race has got faster and faster as it's gone on and the fastest split yet between 35 and 40 kilometers, 16.20, which is approaching 2.15 um, pace, if not on it. And that's why it's done the damage that it has. And that's why you've seen Rosa Derecha pulled away um, and clear of the rest of the women in this field. And it's gonna be, a, in the end, I think a comfortable victory for her. Well, she's hardly breaking sweat. Got that lovely languid rhythm. And none of the chasers making any impact. In fact, she's going further and further away almost with every stride. Well, she looks so good that there's uh, there's little chance of her now being caught or uh, or failing to win, wouldn't you think? Well, she does look very, very composed. As we've talked about, though, sometimes that appearance can be deceptive. People can look composed even when they're falling apart inside, and other people can look as though they're falling apart and they're still holding it together very, very well. So the, pretty much the only person who can get this wrong now is her. If she's misjudged this slightly coming into the finish, but it doesn't look like she has. Um, she's kept herself in a very good position all the way through this race. She's about to make the turn now into the finishing straight and still looks comfortable maybe starting to sway a little bit with her shoulders a, bit, a little bit more than she was earlier on in this race but that's of course inevitable and you can see how much the gap has grown and now it's Malaysia who's paying for having tried to to go with her and trying to to stay with her and she's slipped back from second to third and she's in the last kilometer now surely there's only about three minutes left to run and with that camera foreshortening there's got to be at, well, at least 50 meters there yeah it looks um, a done deal unless something quite spectacular happens she's a, a fascinating performer de Rage. i mean i mentioned she'd won a couple of shanghai marathons that the first of which of which she took around about five minutes of her personal best and a personal best going to get absolutely obliterated again today 2.22.43 um, she's going to be several minutes inside that and it is only 11 weeks as well since that personal best that she's ran so that's a, a very quick turnaround on top of a year in which she's run three marathons already um, so coming back to here having run three in 2017 that's a lot of marathons uh, at a young stage in your career but certainly announcing her arrival as one to be watched on the women's marathoning scene so the race looks for second and third at the moment. Deraji incidentally sixth in this race last year. And looks as if she's going to turn that into a win this time. Well, if she looks behind her, she'll see there's not a great deal of danger. Kadesse currently in that second place. Must be a great feeling, Paul, and one you would know when you, you know you've got the race won and you can kind of enjoy the little, well not, I wouldn't say stroll, but the last 500 metres or so. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's, it's still a, a, a last 500 metres or so that it probably can't go fast enough for these women who have worked very, very hard and they can now see the finish and they're trying to just summon up every last ounce of energy. I'm not sure why Deraja keeps checking her watch at this point in the race. She can see clocks in front of her. She can see the finish line. So she really just wants to be trying to, to get to that line as fast as possible. She's got the race run and now it's Namo as well who's checking his watch. So maybe they just don't trust the official timing out there today. So that's a, at least keeping her honest. And Malese chasing down to Desse to try and get into second place, but Theresia with a very healthy advantage as we come towards 2.19 on the clock. And she can see the finish line clearly in sight. This is going to be, a, well, well inside the course record. The course record is 2.19.31. And here she comes, Rosa Desere, who is putting a superb performance here to win the Dubai Marathon and the course record has been smashed.
and she'll turn round and have a reasonably long wait to see who's going to follow her in for second and third. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great shot. I think it was Tedesse in second and Lessie in third. We'll confirm that for you. There's Tedesse. Yeah, it was uh, Tedesse followed by Malaysia and now De Gaefe, last year's winner, and across the line in that fourth position, but still a significant personal best for her. They're still coming in under 220. I can see Galeta Berka running up the finishing straight. She's just going to miss out on that 220, but she's still going to run a big personal best. And before that, that's to is that Teferi just coming across the line? Well, it's the kind of event that just keeps bringing up surprise winners. We saw it last year. We've seen it again today. Confirmation to Desai finished second. I'm pretty sure it was Malesi in third. And they've enjoyed their day as ever. a bit of help I think she's okay just a precaution but she's certainly put a massive amount of effort into this and third place is a, a very decent performance so it's best all the way uh, there today two two course records and in fact two years ago three women went under 220 but we've had four today and another one Berka the uh, the former world indoor 1500 meters champion just a fraction outside 220 so half a dozen uh, minutes off her uh, her best time it's actually a second successive third place for Gabriel Malese Miss Berka We talked about the progression, Paula, in, in the, me the men's winner, Jeremy. I mean, you say the same for the Asia and the women. As you just see uh, Dida staggering uh, across the line there. And unfortunately, when you get to the closing stages of the marathon and these women are doing all that they can just to, to keep their body moving until you cross the line and you cross the line and it's like your, your mind just quits on you and stops trying to will your body anymore because you've stopped and you've finished and it's not quite sure how to it's best to support itself but she's got help there and I think she's okay but yeah we were just saying that today that I think the both races very very fast slightly contrasting styles the way that they were run and the women maybe showing that it, it's easier and in the end produces a faster time if you can keep it more under control in the first uh, half of the race certainly the first five kilometers for the men I, I would say were, was a little bit too quick and, and maybe cost them faster times that they might have been capable of in these conditions on this course today but Jeremy ran outstandingly well there today judged his race perfectly just kept enough left at the end to really announce his arrival as someone really to be watched on the men's marathon and scene well it came in I think was the fifth fastest time in, in the field today but as we've said on several occasions just with very little experience of running marathons at this level at any level well, he's announced himself today as a genuine player amongst the world's elite well, uh, ladies and gents, it's time for me to go and uh, you know, doorstep the uh, the impromptu press conferences. So uh, it's been uh, been a great morning, as I say, records all round. So uh, I'll uh, I'll be seeing you guys next year. Let's hope so. Thanks very much indeed, Pat. I don't think those supporters are going anywhere. They're going to stay there, especially to salute the winners when they get their medals uh, at the ceremony in a few minutes' time. It's amazing though, Paula, how this event just keeps on throwing up shot winners. You can't predict anything here, can you? 
No, you can't. And I think the more that it does that, the more that it grows. And I, I think the Standard Chartered Dubai Marathon is really becoming known, certainly in Ethiopia, as the place where you can go to, to make your mark, to see how good you can be. So a lot of these uh, men and women will be training away for most of the year getting ready for this race, getting ready for the chance to, to see exactly what they're capable of uh, and to, to go and chance their arm at the, this mythical distance of the marathon and see what they can do over it. And Rosa Dereja has maybe, well, it's a while I think since she was here. She has raced before, it's her second appearance. So last time she finished sixth uh, in this race in 226. So she's taken huge strides forward in that time. She's taken time to learn the trade of marathon running and to really judge it perfectly today. Just doing the obligatory photos, having said thank you to the, the fans. And now she's got the flag as well. I was say, she doesn't look particularly tired, does she either? I guess when you've won a race, you're, like, you're relaxing a bit, but she looks... She looks so fresh throughout the whole of that race. She did look fresh through the race. I think she looks a little bit unsteady under on her feet now, and you can see just the eyes not quite focusing. She, she's run hard and she's given it her all out, out there today as she had to do to win that race and to win that race in as quick a time as, as she has done. So she's maybe now going to take a little bit of a rest and we'll see if it's 11 weeks before she's back in the next marathon. Yeah, that is very tidy work, isn't it? Just 11 weeks, wow. And two victories in, inside three months. Let's have a look at some of the highlights then, beginning with the men's race. They went off at absolutely breakneck speed. Probably turned out to be too quick in hindsight, certainly in terms of producing uh, a lightning quick time. Three pacemakers soon became one. And just uh, after the halfway point, it was clear that we weren't going to be in for a world record, despite the pacemaker checking his watch. He dropped out. That left the magnificent seven. Nearly a problem for Tamarat Tola with uh, an anxious moment there, getting his water bottle. He recovered okay. At one stage, he looked the likely winner, but it was an absolutely thrilling finish, which saw Gerimu out sprint Gabri Selassie with Tola back in third place. A brave attempt to defend his title from 12 months earlier. He looked pretty disconsolate, but didn't really have anything to reproach himself for. The women's race, again, they started in the pitch black. It was a rather different way to the, the men, Paul, wasn't it, the way the women's race developed? Yes, much more controlled. They went through for, uh, halfway pretty much bang on the 70 pace um, requested of the pacemakers and then wound it up from there, going down to a 16, 30 or so, um, five kilometers from 30 to 35 and then 16, 20 for the next one and then continued to wind up from there into the finish the pack gradually whittled down but it was Rosa de Gere in the blue and pink vest who was in control and well placed all the way through that race and then just gradually increased it no significant sprint as we had in the men's race but just a raising of the pace to a victory that was very well deserved smashing a personal best and taking four women through that 220 barrier yep and she will have her name in the record books as the new course record holder here in Dubai. 20 seconds or so inside the previous best. There is a duration. Now, if you have watched our coverage over the last few years, you will know that sometimes there's a little bit of a delay before we get the prize ceremony. And of course, we will bring it to you as soon as that happens. We also saw a, a dominant display in the wheelchair event, which, uh, if you are just joining us, Marcel Hoog on his first appearance here. And the man they call the Silver Bullet secured a victory, beating uh, Hiroyuki Yamamoto 
of Japan into uh, second place. And Ernst van Dijk of South Africa finished third. So just to confirm the results of the 2018 Standard Chartered Dubai Marathon, Jeremu wins, so inexperienced, in exactly two hours and four minutes. Uh, Leo Gebri Selassie finished second. It was a thrilling finish. Tamarat Tola narrowly failing to defend the title that he won so memorably 12 months ago, but still gets on the podium. Uh, Mengistu, Lemma and Negese also played their part in what was a, a fantastic finale to the men's race. And amongst the women, Rosa Derege, who was an unlikely winner, but a very deserving one, Paula. Yeah, extremely deserving and, as you said, smashed through that 220 barrier, smashed a personal best, 219.17, followed by Tedessa, another huge personal best, 219.30, Malesa, 219.36, De Gaefer still under that 220 barrier, and then Tesfaye, who hung in for so much of that race and then just couldn't quite stay with those four once they made the breakaway, tantalizingly close to the 220, and Galeta Burke a six-minute personal best in sixth place and probably the personal best just carried on down the rest of, of that field to ferry there 224 so making that first step up from a f uh, 5000 meter to world-class 5000 meter runner to the marathon uh, and it's been a bit of a, a rude awakening for her I guess over the marathon distance she's found out just how, how tough it can be but she's acquitted herself well Ethiopian flags, wherever you look, <laughs> we've got one Burundi <laughs> just uh, stopping at being a clean sweep of the top ten. It's Bahrain, but she's Ethiopian anyway. Bahrain, I beg your pardon. Close. I think if you, if you contrast those two results lists you, you see the the carnage on the the men's side compared with the women's side where the depth and the the times stayed well up there through the women's um, side but on the men's race the the damage done by that first um, five ten kilometers even the first half that was run so fast was clear the times of the likes of Alamaru with a 2-8 uh, marathon runner there and he's probably capable uh, in a more even paced race uh, of going a significant amount quicker than that. Yeah, I think the writing was on the wall fairly early, wasn't it? We, we were saying they were so far ahead um, running those really quick laps in the first I don't know, half an hour of the race. It, we just never thought a world record was even a remote possibility. I think they believed it was and certainly they had the course to do and they, they went out to, to try and commit to, to doing that but when you when you lay it all on the line that much in the first half then it probably is going to come back to, to bite you in in some respects in, in the closing stages still a little bit of mist and murk about but it's much clearer now than it was when we started we, of course we have the fun runners out on the course Also got a, a 4K fun run that starts a bit later on this morning. What's the... What's the scenario Paul when you as a professional athlete when you when you finished a marathon what's your kind of schedule for the next say week after that what do you actually do 
Oh, a lot of eating, a lot of resting, um, a lot of um, trying to, to recover, I think. Every marathon is different, even when it's run on the same course, it's amazing. The next day when you wake up, it's a different part of your body that, that suffers, be it your hamstrings, your calves, your, your quads. Different parts can, can really be sore the next day, so you don't really know like, until you kind of get that horrible achy leg feeling waking up early in the morning the next day which parts particularly going to suffer then and how well you're going to recover it it doesn't it's not really linear it doesn't correspond to how fast you run how you feel the next day it's, it, it just seems to, to to vary a little bit so in the first few minutes or hours or so after the race it's about trying to to get something into your body trying to to move in somewhere i think many of the marathon runners struggle to actually warm down as you would do for shorter distances so to get out for a jog is going to be very difficult for for most of the people particularly if you've run hard in the marathon just try and walk a little bit maybe get a massage maybe get into an ice cold bath um, and try and just ease some of that soreness away and that's maybe why we're seeing some delay now in, in the athletes coming out for the the presentations because it, it does it takes a lot out out of you running a marathon that hard so to be able to to turn around and, and w walk even up the few steps onto the podium it is tough and it's hard to get your body to do that all the various trophies that will be presented i've always wondered what you get at a seven star hotel that you don't get at a five star hotel what are, what are the extra two stars for? Because you know, you, you actually have to pay to go in if you just want to see it, apparently. You can't just go and have a look and think, oh, is it worth spending half my entire life savings coming here for a week? No, you've got to pay for the privilege. And they can't even see the sea out of their room view today, <laughs> can they? No, it's not the best viewing day, as to be said. Spectacular sight, though, nonetheless. Spectacular country and a very spectacular race, especially the finish to the men's event. It is now the, the sun is starting to, to burn away the early morning mist. You can see it quickly brightening up on those shots and looking down the road for the, the 10K runners uh, due off, I think, at 9 o'clock. And you can see them starting to, to build for that race. It is going to be warm. Uh, I think temperatures today are predicted to be around 26, 27 degrees uh, centigrade. So it's, it's going to be a warm race for those runners, but pretty much ideal conditions for, for the marathon. I think um, making that decision to move it the hour earlier paid off certainly on the women's side in terms of the times but in terms of the race that it produced on the men's side as well it was a very very competitive race uh, and seeing that 2-4 barrier go and two course records they couldn't really ask for much more the organizers here i know they would like to see a world record but that's a, a big ask at the moment Well, we are expecting around about a 20-minute uh, delay until we get the medal presentation, so uh, we will bring that to you uh, when it happens. But for the meantime, uh, from Pat Butcher, Paul Aracle, from me, Trevor Harris, hope you've enjoyed our coverage of the, of the races. Spectacular finish uh, in the men. And rejoin us again in about 20 minutes, and we'll hand out the medals. Bye for now.